Why does it grab the wrong camera? Howdy. Welcome back to Dion Talk. This is going to be a live stream that goes on as long as the questions do. Uh, it's going to be a little bit weird for me. It's been an odd day. Uh, I have been saying for a while that my plan was to retire somewhere between three years from now and tomorrow. So that's been my joke. The timeline is between three years from now and tomorrow is when I'm going to retire. Um, and in this video, I'm going to talk about not only how I was able to retire, but why I chose today to do it. I've got a couple of friends, uh, Matt the Lumberjack Landlord, who's still working and is going to get this picture of the Pink Panther laying in bed, not going to work every day until the day he retires. And Michael Zuber from One Rental at a Time, who, who is retired and treats every day like it's Saturday. So I'm joining Mike in the Every Day is Saturday Club. Mike went into work one day. He worked in software. He was leading a team and basically told his employers, you know, these are things I don't want to do. And they put this pile of stuff on his desk. That was all the things he didn't want to do. He went in at eight. I think he walked out by 845 and he was done. For me today, I went, technically went to work, Zoom, had a great day, actually resolved a big, huge issue, like a huge problem went away because of today. So I retired. I like my job. I love my job. I get to run a CDL school. I play in trucks like it's a go-kart. You know, and semis driving around. I get to teach people how to drive trucks. We have simulators. Um, it's not even really like having a job. Except for the fact that it is Monday to Friday. There is an alarm clock that tells me when I got to go to work. And the responsibility of the job kind of sucks. Uh, 60 staff who basically re rely on me for every Monday there to be enough clients for the staff to have a job and then employers relying on us to have enough students to you know satisfy the driver shortage needs and students relying on us to manage the company right so there's all like all these responsibilities that comes from having a job so it's not that my job sucked because most people quit they don't quit their job they quit their boss and i technically really haven't had one the owners of the company several years ago moved to arizona now they live in florida um they don't micromanage. They're great to work with. They've compensated me really well. I felt totally felt treated fairly the whole time I worked at this company. So I'm, I'm actually curious what made me choose to retire. And, and now, in case you've ever wondered how old I am, <laughs> 52, um, why I chose today. We had an issue with our company with a, a regulatory body. So like a state agency or a federal agency or something that thought our school was doing something wrong, came in to audit us. We had some audits going on and they thought they found something. So while there was this issue going on, I thought, well, I'm never going to retire as long as there's this thing I've got to handle. Um, well, we reached resolution with that today. We presented the facts. We showed what they were looking for wasn't factual. So they lifted all of the problems and all of the problems just magically went away. So it's a great day. I went to work literally with like an inventory of things to talk about to prove our case. Uh, and one, got them to come around to seeing things our way. And so for a month or so, I've been telling myself, I can't, I can't retire because I can't leave the company in a lurch. They, they need my leadership. They need me for this thing right now. This is what I'm good at. But we resolved it. So if that was the thing that was keeping me there, perfect time to turn in my notice. So I've never retired before. <laughs> I've quit some jobs before where you go, hey, I'm giving you my two weeks notice. Uh, I've ran the company for the last several years trying to make sure that the company was sound just in case I passed away or got fired or whatever to where it would need to run without me being there. So I have a great leadership team. I've got each campus has great managers. I've got office staff trained up. I've got basically my replacement trained up. I've got two different people taking on different roles. Um, partially so that I wasn't needed so I could help grow the school and travel if I needed to. Or in case one day I decided to retire, which when I was 40, I probably thought I was never going to. I thought I'm the kind of guy that's going to work until he dies or the person who's going to work until they die. I told my kids that for years. I uh, never started investing until after 40. I didn't even start looking at finances until after 40. It took about eight years. So from 2010 to 2018, it took eight years to go from bad debt, not making a lot of money, to making pretty good money, no bad debt, and financially free. Could have retired in 2018. 
but loved my job. Had no reason to not work there. Stayed for four more years. Exponentially grew the cash flow. It's not you know twice what my my expenses are. It's five times what my expenses are, and continuing to grow uh, without me actively having to grow it. Just just based on recycling cash flow, appreciation, principal pay down, all these things that just are like hockey stick growth that people talk about. But to, until you experience the income snowball, it doesn't think, seem like it's a real thing. But all of a sudden, it doesn't become, how do I acquire the next cash flowing asset? It's how do I find the next asset to put the money to work because the money's piling up, which is an interesting, fun problem to have. But here was the mental shift at why, why I choose to retire at 52. And this is the thing that I think I'll have to explain a few times to some of the people that I know who don't invest. And when they look at money, they just hear the dollar signs. They just see the amount. The kind of people where you ask something like, how much money do you think you need to retire? They don't say $5,000 a month in cash flow or $10,000 or $7,500. They say a million dollars or $5 million or whatever. They'll have a number thinking that that's what financial freedom is, not realizing that if you're watching this and you're in this community, it is a passive income, money that comes in that you don't have to sell your life for one hour at a time that, that comes in that is more than your living expenses, makes you financially free. I have had at this company what are called golden handcuffs. The owners would like me to stay. I've grown the company. When I first started working there, there were six staff and we had one location. I had a couple of ideas that grew the company to five locations and 60 staff. Um, to where they, the previous owner made less than six figures in profit to the new owners have uh, seven figures in profit. And the first number is not a one. Like, I mean, they're, they're doing really well. So they give you this thing called golden handcuffs. They want you to stay at the company. So sometimes it's money, like that you get paid more. So I started making more money as I, as I worked there. In the first few years, it was very confusing to the, the new owners when the last one retired because they kept trying to give me a raise. And I kept saying, I don't want a raise. I, I, I had worked in grocery when I was in high school at a you know grocery store, and the 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 store manager always got fired every two years or so, and the the second or third person would get promoted, saving the store fifty thousand dollars in wages. I didn't want to be the person making a lot of money who was cut the first time we had a tight year, so I wanted to resist that. So they started um, paying on a percentage basis. So you have the salary, which wasn't very much. My instructors made more money than me on salary basis. But I could make money based on the profitability of the company, which was, you know, motivation to grow the company was their mindset. But golden handcuffs are, as long as you work here, here is another benefit that you get. 10% uh, ownership of the company. To the point where if the company were to sell, I would get 10% of that. And the company has a devaluation of around $20 million, So I would get $2 million. The government would take their portion. But... As long as I work there, there's around $2 million on the line. I turned in my notice today, walking away from $2 million handcuffs. And that's, that's not even a second thought. That money means nothing to me. The, to the people that I talk to, you know, not in the financial freedom, retire early community, but to the people who I interact with on a daily basis who probably live paycheck to paycheck, don't invest because it's gambling, uh, wouldn't look at real estate because they don't want to deal with tenants, toilets and termites, and, and they just don't think that they could handle it or whatever their reasoning is, would call me insane for walking away from $2 million and not looking back. Because, and this is a quote from a sports ball, if Matt's watching still. I think it was LeBron that said something like, when you don't have enough, money is the only thing. And once you have enough, money is just a thing. Well, to me, money is just a thing. The cash flow from my assets is a little over five times what it costs me to live. So more financial freedom doesn't help me. I'm not the two or three Lamborghini kind of person. I'm not the $40,000 a month Airbnb kind of person. I have pretty pretty simple means, I'm going to have to struggle to figure out how to spend the money that I have coming in. Because when we're working towards financial freedom, in my mind, for several years, basically, we're broke. No matter how much money you're making and how much money that you're able to add cash flowing assets to it before you really start to experience the income snowball. Because as you're making money, the goal should be to make as much as you can 
spend as little as you can, save and invest the difference. So it's like three steps, increase what you make, decrease what you spend, but then save and invest that difference. Toward no matter what, that difference is always being saved for investing. So we're always living on what we what it takes for us to live. When you're working a W-2, a lot of people think when I retire, it's going to cost me more money. Not realizing that while you're working, you're saving for retirement, you're saving to invest, you're paying the highest form of taxes, you have a commute, you, you have all of these things. The only thing that often costs more once we retire for most people is healthcare. And so you just need an asset that covers your healthcare expense, just like food or transportation or housing. You need something that's going to pay that. So you need an asset for every expense. I have all of that in place. But here was the thought that took me from, I love my job. There's no reason to leave. Bosses are great. So I'm not quitting my boss, which is the reason most people leave their job. It was, I'm 52. I spent my 40s growing this company and investing in real estate. This is a side hustle. It's a six-figure side hustle. But it takes two or three hours a, a month uh, to run my rentals. If this is your first time to my channel, uh, my name is Dion. These are Dion Talks. I have 16 rental units that cash flow a little bit over $14,000 a month. My goal is to teach people how to grow a portfolio like that or bigger while you're working a W-2 full-time job. I started as a single parent with three kids and invested along the way. Two times I've house hacked where I lived in a duplex on one side, rents it out the other. And now I have a unit of a fourplex that I live in and rent out the other three. So I'm being paid to live where I'm at. So I invest in buy and hold small multifamily real estate and I still house hack. But I've spent my 40s growing a company for someone else and investing in real estate for myself. I was thinking when I'm 70, if I make it that far, do I want to remember my 50s as another decade that I grew a company for someone else? Or do I want to remember this as the decade that I traveled every day? I never had an alarm clock. I woke up and did what I felt like that day. And as much as possible, I helped other people reach financial freedom. That's something that I take away from a YouTube channel I watch called Joe Kuhn. If you get a chance to check it out, his last name is K-U-H-N. He retired at 54. He's been retired about four years now. Uh, he did it with stocks and used the bucket uh, method to retire. But I watch his stuff because he talks a lot about what I've been dealing with for the last few months of thinking about what will retirement look like? What will saying to my... Uh, company owners, I'm going to retire look like? What will the considerations to be? And he talks about retire to something, not from something. If you, you know, I worked in law enforcement, I was in the military, and a lot of military and law enforcement always talk about if you retire, you have two years and then you're dead. Most people retire and then for two years later, they die. That's because the idea with military or law enforcement is you retire to a pension where you never have to do anything and you can literally do nothing, which then makes you die because you have no motivation, no drive, no aspirations. Um, I'm sure it's a misquoted statistic, but it's one that we talk about often in those two fields. So I figured if I have something like YouTube, a book, a course, going and doing live presentations, doing live meetups here in our local area, helping other people reach financial freedom, I'm retiring to something. So that's more time to do something I really enjoy, which I enjoyed the CDL thing. It's not like that I didn't enjoy that. Um, I just didn't have the type of ownership that I will over something like this. So this is me coming out. Uh, had the meeting with the company owners this morning. I wanted to make sure that I did that before I talked with anybody about, hey, I'm retiring. I didn't want them to find out from another source. Um, and now my goal is to figure out if it's possible for me to get as many of you as possible into the same situation. And I didn't just go and have a Zoom meeting with my bosses and say, hey, I quit today. And here's the keys, right? Like I'm going to take, I've been training people to replace me, but there's a few last things to touch up on. So I don't know if it's going to take two weeks or two months, but somewhere in there, I'll just slowly be fading away until I just disappear from working there. Um, a life without an alarm clock, uh, but still a life with meaning. So my goal tonight is to answer every question that comes in. The topics can range from anything about retiring in your 50s or earlier, uh, real estate, financial freedom. If you want really bad relationship advice, you can ask those questions too. Um, 
Brian, howdy. It is official. Is it official or did you do your three-year notice? I've been talking about the three-year notice for a while. Uh, this was an official, I am done. This is now an exit strategy and my protege needs to work on his ascension plan. Um, Tom, glad you're back. Matt rocked it last week. I did. I watched Matt's last week. It was great. I liked that his son came in at the end, <laughs> said some things and runs out going, enjoy your live stream. That's perfect. Um, you had to binge minority mindset this past week. Don't raise financially stupid kids. <laughs> Got away with words. He does. I do watch Jaspreet Singh on minority mindset often. Um, he's usually got some good stuff. I, I like his content, but it, uh, so there's also something when you make, when you do live streams like this today, is just one where I'm talking about, Hey, I'm retiring. This is, this is how I did it. This is how I announced it. There's probably nothing in that first 15 minutes of this, this live stream that I'm going to take out and make another video of, but some of my live streams, the first 10 or 20 minutes is, is something I can pull out and make another video, of, which I kind of want to do. But one of the reasons I haven't is because of minority mindset. He does he did a lot of great live or edited content that was new, which I use to stay focused on finances, stay focused on like the overall idea of financial freedom. But for the last two years, his channel has been a team of people going into his longer interviews and pulling out 10 minute sections and putting in a beginning and an outro of those 10 minute sections. So I feel like I'm getting a lot of the repeat, like, like I don't mind hearing the same concept two or three times, but I don't want to hear the, like watch the same video two or three times. Um, so I wish you would do less of that and more just just break talking. And that's kind of the way I'm trying to structure my information is I can make edited videos. I can make the ones where I play different characters, but that seems to be really hard for people to watch on YouTube because a lot of people watch it with the app closed. So I don't do those very often. But I want people to understand in this live stream format, what information does Michael Zuber, Matt the Lumberjack Landlord, or me like keep in our mind for day-to-day -day decisions? When we see a rental property, what are the numbers we run? When we look at a neighborhood, what are we looking for? When I do a vacancy walk through the other day, the first time I walk into one of my own units, what am I looking at? What am I going to replace? What am I mentally making a list of things I need to get? Or what is handyman work? What is contractor work? So that when you're looking at this, you know that we don't have a, a, a checklist at home that says, here's what I'm doing as an investor today. This is how I run the numbers. This is how many deals I'm going to look at. It's just stream of consciousness thought when the questions come up. This is the information that makes an investor successful that you just keep top of mind awareness with. So I like to do live streams more than I'm liking the edited videos. I also like to be able to answer questions. Dividend Dave, howdy. Tom, howdy. Don, <laughs> welcome back. Howdy. Cody, howdy. Welcome back. Huge congrats if you did pull a trigger on retirement, which I did. I don't even want to read this out loud, but Don said maybe he retired and got married. Haven't lost my mind. Just my job. Jay Camp, howdy. Congratulations on retirement. Thank you. John, Texas, howdy. Jay Hayes, cheers. Dawn, today, yes, today. Sometime between now and two years was today. Cheers, having one in your honor tonight. Thank you, um, yes. Yeah, so. Thank you to our sponsor, which is, as usual, almost gone this time though, Alien Vodka, who does not actually sponsor the channel, but they do make the videos possible. So, cheers. Every time I drink that, I want to say smooth after, but I don't trust my voice for a second. Uh, Larry Chong, howdy. Back already, yes. But I did have to do a couple hours of work this morning, so I'm ready for an, the next vacation, which I think I'm going to make permanent now, you know, based on this. Love the walkthrough vacancy. Thank you. I liked it, too. It was uh, really cool. If you've seen that video, great. If you haven't, I had a tenant move out that moved out of area, so it's like my fourth tenant turnover now in 11 years. Um, I've had two in the last two months. One purchased a house, one moved out of the area. I had never been in the unit before. I got an inspection report. 
I had to go back and look. I thought I bought it in 2018. It was actually when I bought it in 2020, but the tenant had been there since 2018. That's why that number was in my head. So tenant's been there about four years. I got it in 2020. I never went inside. The inspector did and somehow decided to call one of the rooms a den or family room. So I was under the impression it was a single bedroom, which was rented out for a good price in the area. I'll be doing a short live stream this week on the slides. Um, about the numbers on that. And um, actually, I might do that here sometime with Zoom so that I can share my screen because what I'm going to do is go, I have a vacancy. These are the things I'm doing. But here's how I'm going to set the rents and how I came up with the rental number that I'm at, which is significantly more than what I expected when I first thought I'd go walk and do that walkthrough. Uh, on a side note, when I walk in there, granite countertops, slow close, slow close cabinets that are in mint condition, Basically, the only thing I really need to do is flooring and some minor touch-up on paint and replace a light or two. It's really simple stuff. And the tenants left it perfect, so they're getting their full uh, deposit back. Jeremy Kirkwood, howdy. Hope this isn't clickbait. You deserve it. It is not clickbait. This is, I turned in my notice, had that conversation that I would like to retire, and this is me letting you know I'm going to retire. Um, I think they had a pretty good inkling because they've seen some YouTube content. Uh, they, we have the same accountant, so they, they know my cash flow. Um, they know my lifestyle. They know that I, it's been four years since I've worked at the company for money, uh, that I'm working there out of a sense of loyalty because they gave me a shot um, that no one else had. And I have loyalty to the, the employees. Um, but now I think we've got systems in place and the right management teams where I'm stepping away. And I don't think the company will be negatively impacted. Um, Lumberjack landlord. Saw Don's comment, and you said you thought you think Dion may puke <laughs> just a little in my mouth. Jay Hayes, maybe Dion should have a fruity drink. Yes, with like a forty percent um, alcohol content. When you have so many drinks on a ship that they see you coming, and they just write your name in the drink. That's when you know you're on a cruise and you've probably drank too much because they start writing your name on your drink as you walk up. Um, howdy, REI Stoners. Ryan, howdy. Tom, thank you. Dividend day, have you retired? Yes. Told them today, have that exit strategy to work out. Not sure of the timeline of that, but it's not going to be very long. Um, I am available. Uh, they talked about being a consultant afterward, and I said, I'm available no matter what, because my goal is to make sure that I leave them stable. Um, so, Laura, thank you. Uh, muchas gracias. Jeremy, I'll never forget the day I quit 23 September 21. Congratulations. Time flies. I have had so much more time to work even harder as a real estate investor. This won't be an issue for you, but I would suggest routine now. Yeah, the, the first thing is to set up a few things like... Uh, a workout schedule. Um, it's been easy to do it with, you know, this is when you have to go to work and this is when you have to leave. So around there, but when you literally have your whole day uh, and you are a nerd that would game for 23 hours straight on occasion, I'll have to figure that out. Phil Nealon, howdy. Thank you, Julie. The audit is a little going away gift. I'm so happy for you. So thank you. Thank you, Julie. Jeremy, I'm generally happy to hear this. Me too. Tiffany, howdy. Thank you. What does the inspector look for? Home inspector? Um, they basically look the house over from top to bottom, not to fix anything, but basically give you a list of things that would need fixed. They your generally your home inspection report for most I've worked with two or three different companies over the years will come red font for emergency items that need to be addressed. Like if your roof has less than a certain number of years left on it or water heater is not strapped or leaking or anything, you know, foundation issues will just be in red. But they're going to look at things like all of your electric outlets, make sure that they're powered right, make sure that they trip the breaker, uh, make all your GFCIs are where they're supposed to be. All doors and windows function. 
they do water testing. So they, they have machines basically that they point at the floor and, you know, in the bathroom and the kitchen and anywhere with there's water to see if there's moisture in the floors. Um, they go into the crawl space, they go into the attic, they go, they look at everything. Um, so Matt, the lumberjack landlord has done so many rehabs. He'll sometimes probably now almost all times do a purchase without an inspection. I still, since I've only, you know, I've only bought seven properties. I still have an inspection report done, even though I have 16 rental units, it's because they're small multifamily. Um, does a few things. The inspection report that you get from the inspector is usually worded very scary. So the first time you see a home inspection report, it's going to look scary. It's going to look like the place is falling down, and usually when there's very little wrong with it, because the inspector is trying to protect themselves so that you can't come back after a purchase and say, hey, there were all these things wrong, but they weren't in your report. So they're literally looking for everything wrong with the place that they can find. Well, that gives you a list to take things out and show a seller and say, these are the things that need addressed. Here's what I think it would cost, like a negotiation tool. One of the reasons that I don't have my real estate license is because in some areas, realtors are not allowed to share portions of the inspection report with the sellers. It's against the local rules, but I'm not an agent, so no rules apply. So I've used that to negotiate the price during most of my purchases. And then it also gives me a to-do list afterwards, tells me things I think that I can handle, things that a contractor can handle, things a handyman can handle, or sometimes it's been things that I want my handyman to do, but I wanna work next to them so that I can learn how to do this next time. So basically they look for everything. They will take stuff like a stick with a metal nail on the end and they'll push into things, your soffits on your roof to figure out where wood is soft. Uh, things that you couldn't just tell by looking at it because somebody could have painted over it and it looks good, but it was all, it had water damage. They look for uh, pretty much everything. You, you can pay extra to have like your sewer lines inspected too or the septic inspected, that's not included in most normal. Like they'll do things like flush to make sure it works or run water to make sure it works. They run the appliances to make sure they work. Give you an itemized list of what's good and what's bad in that property. It is not a requirement to have a professional inspection. When you submit an offer, most times, you, I've done this every time, you make an, an appraisal contingency. So in, in a buyer's market, you'll say things like, well, if it comes in under appraisal, I won't, I won't buy it, I'll just back out. In a seller's market, sometimes we say, I'll do an appraisal contingency, but if it comes in five or $10,000 low, I'll cover the difference, so making your offer look more attractive to the seller. We've been in the seller's market for two years, but we're shifting away from that now. Um, and my brain shut off. One of the beautiful things about doing a live. Uh, the home inspection reports. So it's not required to have an inspection report done by a professional. What we'll do is we'll have the appraisal contingency, but then we have an inspection contingency, which the inspection is not what I'm going to use to keep, to, to decide if I want the property or not. I want those days, whether it's five or 10 days that you stipulate in your offer that give me that much time to make up my mind because I make offers on properties I've never seen. I do it all every two or three offers a week on properties I've never looked at. I haven't even Google street maps them sometimes. I literally just look at the pictures, I run the math, I know the neighborhoods that are good and bad. So I make the offer with those contingencies, appraisal contingency and inspection contingency with the time period. Because I'll make 20, 30 more offers sometimes before you get one accepted. Once it's accepted, now I'll go drive by the area, look and see, is it how, how's the street arranged? Is there parking the way that I'm going to like it? Is the building layout the way I'm going to like it? Is it next to something noisy, train tracks, airport, club, or whatever, any other detractors in the area? That time period for that inspection isn't to get an inspection to make sure I want it or not. It's to decide for that if, if I want it or not. There has been one time where the inspection report and a really low appraisal had me back out of one deal, but every other time I've followed through and used the inspection report as a, as a, as a uh, negotiation tool. Thank you, Chester. Howdy. And then my chat moved, which I appreciate, which means there's more questions, which I like. Um, Larry, so according to advice you're given before, what are you retiring to? I am retiring to 
time freedom is the most important thing, but I'm retiring to, I think, helping as many people as I can reach financial freedom. And I don't know what that looks like yet. I know it's going to equal probably uh, more YouTube videos. Uh, I don't know that if it'll eat, it'd be coaching. Um, still uncomfortable about taking money directly from somebody to try to help them. Um, going to write a book. Going to finish the audiobook for one rental at a time. I'll probably do that before I'm actually done, done working. Uh, I only have not much left. Um, probably going to develop a course so that all the information is in a linear format, structured in a way that I would want it. Um, probably have those three things done. But that's what I'm retiring to, helping other people reach financial freedom and traveling and doing it from as many different places as I can and just seeing what life without an alarm clock is like. Kevin, howdy. Sounds like you retired on a high note. Like <laughs> I did retire on a high note, which is weird. I, I made that comment with Michael Zuber today. I said, it's funny. You went into work, had a bad day and quit. I went into work, had a great day. So I quit. Um, Adam, howdy. Thank you. All right, stoners. Hey, Chester, what platforms can I follow you? We've been trying to talk Chester into doing something. I'm not sure which ones, but I'm sure he's on a few. Hopefully soon. Doug, howdy. Best wishes on your bright future. Thank you. Tom, let you <laughs> submit your resume. Awesome. Angel, howdy. Tom, you actually sent me a message the other day. I wasn't sure how to interpret it. I think it was something like, and I need to do a video specifically on this topic because I got this message from about four different people and yours was close to the others. It was something like, don't retire because you have a bunch of debt. I wish I had more debt. More debt would make me retire easier and more comfortably. Um, so I'm gonna make a video explaining, not only can you retire with debt, but I wish I had more debt now that I'm retiring. Um, I almost delayed retiring until I could create more debt. Um, but I also have a reason why I didn't do that too. Angel, thank you. Chester, thank you. Now comes the tough part, finding a new purpose. Solving this is secret is one of the keys to life. Yeah. I think I agree. I think, I think we have to find purpose. But I also think it's really sad that most of us find purpose in our job on purpose. And I know that's kind of a play on words, but you have to work to generate income until you have enough money to put it to work to generate income. So a lot of people justify that job by saying, my job is fulfilling. But if you ask the majority of people, tomorrow you win $100 million with the lottery. Don't ask them to answer it because if their boss or anybody is around, they're probably going to say, oh, I would stay at work. I love my job that much. But how many people would even let anybody know that they weren't coming in tomorrow? So is the purpose the job or do we find purpose in the job because we have to do the job anyways? Anyway. Tamika, howdy. Thank you. You demonstrated true financial freedom by making the decision to walk away no matter the amount attached to the golden handcuffs. Thank you. That, and that's exactly how I look at it. Um, yeah, there would have been a time where I would have stayed at a job for a $20,000 bonus, the potential for a $20,000 bonus. So to now look and go a couple million dollars, not worth staying, even in a job I like. So... Chester, one secret I use, active hobbies. What if mine is chess? We should play sometime. Um, there's an app for that. I've always wanted to learn how to play, which is what I say just before I place people. Um, I'm also a gamer that I'm sure that there's a million video games I can play. I know Scott Trench from Bigger Pockets Money, you know, the CEO of Bigger Pockets, took six months and just gamed when he reached financial freedom and they got bored. And, uh, I've never been bored in my life yet, so I'm looking forward to seeing what bored looks like. Lumberjack, 
good sports ball reference, and I will help you spend it. <laughs> now I got to step up my vacation game. Happy for you. Oh, I've, I've actually got to send you the picture. I don't know if I've done that today or not yet. Do I have it here available? Yep. So this is the picture that's going to Matt every day until he retires. How to avoid stress at work? This did not go to work. Um, enjoy that, Matt. It's going to come every day. And your vacation game has to get better, too. I mean, at least do as many as I have. And to be fair, to be fair, I was 48 when I took my first vacation. So it's not like I did a whole bunch of vacations my whole life. It was just in the last few years when the income snowball kicked in. And I was like, the first one I took was to Columbia. I went there with my brother. We spent a month there. And I came home and I had more money than when we left. And I thought I should take another vacation. I come home to more money. Chester. Last one standing, Matt. 45, 6, 14. Good memory. Yep. We'll see if you retire the youngest. You are you are like my younger, much younger, much younger, cuter brother. Million, howdy. Congratulations. Thank you. I am that's what I'm hoping for is more free, no more time freedom to help more people do the same thing. Um, and I've said that before. I've said um, one of the reasons why I re why I worked towards financial freedom. Well not work towards financial freedom, but reached financial freedom and then started doing things like answering questions in the Facebook groups and being active in the Bigger Pockets forums and becoming a teaching assistant for Bigger Pockets and making a YouTube channel and doing all of these things. And, and, I, and I've said, this is why. And it's a very selfish reason. 11 years ago, I would consider myself super poor, $89,000 in bad debt in my name I didn't know about until the divorce, single parent with three kids making $17 an hour. Like, life sucked. 11 years later, I'm walking away from a $2 million handcuffs and don't care, right? Like the cash flow from, from income that I don't have to sell my life for is enough to where money is just a thing. I can only experience that once. Like I'm not stupid and I'm not going to give away everything so that I can figure out financial freedom again so that I can experience it again, right? But every single person watching this that shares, this is the 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 property I just closed on, or here's the deal I want to make an offer on, but I don't know if I'm sure on the numbers, or how do you figure out how to set your rents, or ask any of those questions. I get to experience you reaching financial freedom. And it's a very close emotional experience than doing, literally doing it myself, is to helping somebody else do it. Um, so very much looking forward to that. Well done, Chester. Um... Tom, I hope we get to see more split personality videos. I would like to do those, but like I said, I got a whole bunch of complaint comments because people weren't watching. And apparently when I stand over here and I talk and I stand over here and I talk, I sound a lot the same if you're not looking at the screen. Um, Cody, I was thinking the same thing, Chester. When's the cutoff, Lumberjack? It depends on how much sarcasm Matt can take. He's got pretty thick skin. Million, painting your house hack. Awesome. Nice. Cody, what's the place you want to travel to the most? I I like bodies of water, so it doesn't really matter where. I like to scuba dive, but I also like to just hang out in bodies of water. Um, so I just finished an Alaska cruise. I, I enjoy, very much enjoyed Colombia, but I very much enjoyed Thailand. I think the scuba diving in Thailand was a lot more fun, a less, lot less uh, murder sharky, um, if that's a word. Uh, you have tiger sharks in Thailand. They're huge, but you know, they, they're like a big cow, basically. Um, warm waters. And the most important thing when traveling to other countries for me, at least I couldn't tell, <laughs> they don't hate Americans. Like, I don't want to go anywhere in Europe because everywhere I've heard of in Europe pretty much hates Americans. And I get it. I've met most of us or enough of us to be the same, right? Um, yeah. So probably back to Thailand, somewhere like that. The plan this year, so last year, 2020, the COVID hit, so I didn't really take a vacation. Um, so 2018 was Colombia, 2019 was Thailand, 2020, nothing. 2021, my brothers and me took a trip around the country. We spent a whole month just driving around. Um, 
the goal for 2022 was Russia and political climate change. So that's not on the list currently. <laughs> um, so back to Thailand, probably. Lumberjack, 45, 6, 14, January 7th, 2023 means I retire younger than Mike if that race matters. No, it's just today. Today is the only thing that matters. Cody, countdown has started. Yep. ML, howdy. Congrats. You've mentioned that you pay off your credit card right after using it. Is there a difference in credit score with paying it off right away versus due date? Depending on the credit agency that your um, lender that you're trying to use uses, credit agencies pull your balance on a different day of the month. So it's not so much, it's your credit utilization that can look different. So I I just make sure that it, it's never had more than 10% on a credit card at one time. And and I, if you're familiar with my content, you know that I have some uh, brain trauma from Desert Storm and my mind just blinks out sometimes. And if I pay off the credit card every single day, I never miss a payment. So me, it's more of a memory thing. And I, I wouldn't want credit card on auto pay. For some reason, that has messed a lot of people up. Uh, so I just pay it off every day. I don't know that it has a more positive effect on your credit score to make it worth doing that. But one of the reasons I use the Bank of America credit card is because I get to pick the category that gets the most cash back by the month. So I can change it when I know I'm going to be doing different things. But it's all in one app. Checking account, savings account, credit card. Um, here's your overshare for the day. So Bank of America... You open up one app and then it'll load. The top one is checking, then your savings, and then the bottom is credit card. So if you look there, I'm like negative $29.11 because I paid the payment for the charge that I did today. Um, so I never have to think about it. I don't have to worry about logging in and, and making a payment on something and waiting for it to go through. You literally, I just log into my banking account and it's a transfer. It's not even a payment. I just transfer money from the account to the credit card. So I've never carried a balance um, used for cash back. So with the Bank of America credit card, I spend two to $3,000 a month on my credit card because um, I do everything I possibly can on the credit card, try not to use cash for anything. Um, and I get 60 to $110 a month back on cash back on things I was going to be buying anyways that don't cost me any more to use my credit card. So I'm sure I could probably make more money, save more money, especially if I'm gonna be traveling now by doing these travel hacking points thing. But little brain, remember with the Marines, the blue crayons taste the best. So I just did simple, just give me the cash, I'll use the cash. Good question though, thank you, ML. RA Stoners, congrats, cheers, thank you. Millennial Health and Mindset, howdy. If you were relocating, would you consider keeping an out-of-state rental if it cash flowed well? If it cash flowed with property management, absolutely. I would probably like to have out-of-state rentals. I'm all currently located in Washington State, so if Mount Rainier goes off, <laughs> no bueno. Um, I wouldn't mind having rentals in other states, but I, I actually very much admire Millennial Mike's strategy. He's house hacking in a high cost of living area, Seattle, which Blech, I wouldn't live there, but I'm in a high cost of living area, Tacoma, house hacking. But then he invests out of state and gets probably a better cash on cash return than I'm getting. Um, so yes, I would keep them out of state if it cash flowed with property management. That would be the caveat. And I have several videos on my channel on why I don't have property management. And if I did have property management, the things I would require. Um, John Williams, howdy, thank you. Travis, howdy, thank you. Means more YouTube videos, right? Um, I don't know if it means more, it might mean better quality. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, it gives me more time to research, make sure that I've got concepts down. I, I like to do three a week. Um, I love Michael Zuber's content. I watch every one of his morning updates. I watch probably about half of his other videos. And one thing that he says constantly is he makes so much, he doesn't expect anybody to watch all of his content. So. I don't want to make so much that people are picking and choosing which videos to watch. I think I think three a week seems to be the right amount for me where people still return to watch the videos. And I have a couple of days to come up with an actual new concept or find a different way of presenting the same concept to help it stick better. 
one of the things I like that I got as a skill set from working at the truck driving school is you learn how to do something, but there's five ways to teach it. And the person you're teaching, one of those ways is going to stick. So as the teacher, you have to know all five ways to teach the concept because one of them will be the one that works for the client and you don't know which one that is until you've tried all five sometimes. So I believe real estate's the same thing. Um, I talked about, I didn't invest for a decade because my brother kept saying one sentence, just this one sentence stopped me from investing for 10 years of my life. He said, every time I buy a rental property in 11 years, I get my money back. And I looked at that and I thought, well, that's kind of stupid. <laughs> like he had his money. He bought a property so that he wouldn't have his money for 11 years. And then he got his money back. So I thought of the concept of teaching people how to buy rental properties without spending money. Because that was the concept I had. He was spending his money to get it back in 11 years. That sounded stupid. But when we look at it from this concept, same idea, like you're just going to buy a rental property and you're going to in 11 years, you're going to make the amount of money back that it took to buy the property. But you don't spend any money. You just move money. You take money from the bank and you move it into the rental property. It's still there. It's still yours. You can cash out refinance, home equity line of credit, or sell the property to get your money back. It's there. You've just moved it from the bank into the property. And in 11 years on his, his method, his cash flow would equal the amount that he moved. So he was doubling his money in 11 years. Once I looked at it like I'm not spending money to get it back in 11 years, I'm looking at it as I'm moving money, then it clicked for me. So there, it was two different ways of looking at the exact same purchase, but one resonated with me. And that's the trick here with, with having you know YouTube teaching is figuring out how do I present the information, sometimes the exact same information, but in a different angle, to where I find the angle where it clicks with you and makes it more likely for you to actually work, you know, succeed at the next investment. Chester, six months from this Thursday. Now, there's a topic for the three amigos of five for this week. Absolutely. Adam, love you too. <laughs> um, and then my chat moved. Julius, howdy. Congrats on your retirement. I know you speak about house hacking, two duplexes. How much did you accelerate your snowball and would you have been where you are without them? No, would not have. Without house hacking, I don't know that I would have even gotten to two rental properties yet. Um, wasn't making a lot, had a bad debt to income ratio. So purchasing with a house hack with a duplex and having rental income on my tax returns was the only way to get into the duplex. Uh, I think people making more money who can save faster can probably do what I did in less than 10 years. But if you're not making a lot of money and you're starting with a bad debt to income ratio, I think house hacking accelerated it by, it probably took 30 years off of the strategy to, to get to where I'm at now. It would have taken 40 years, but instead it took just over 10 because of house hacking. And, and here's, a, here's a simple example. And, I, and, I'll, and I'm not gonna correct you. I'm just gonna say, you know, here's the, here's the details. My first house hack was a duplex. When I moved into it, I had been paying $1,500 a month for an apartment. When I moved into the duplex, duplex, I was then paying $300 a month. So I reduced my living expenses. I didn't eliminate them, but I was able to save an extra $1,200 a month towards the next investment. A couple of years later, it was like I bought two more duplexes before I bought the fourplex. So now I'm in a fourplex house hacking this unit where... I'm when I first moved in, I was being paid $1,700 a month uh, to live here. Now, after using the binder strategy, I'm being paid $2,500 a month to live here. So the first house hack is cash flowing because both units are rented out now. That's making a little over $1,000 a month. And I was making $800 right when I moved out. But again, rents go up. A mortgage and stayed pretty much the same. Taxes and insurance went up some, but rents have skyrocketed. So that's making even more money now. But let's take that first house hack out and just look at this one. Just this the house hack I'm in now. It's a fourplex and I'm cash flowing $2,500 a month. So if, if we don't look at work and we don't look at any other assets that cash flow, before we look at assets that cash flow or work, me and someone else, most people are renting or have a house. Most people aren't house hacking. Most people are one of those two things. They're either renting a place or they have a house. 
And the average rent is, it's you know, depending on whether you have one, two, three, four bedrooms or whatever, it's, there's places where it's higher, places where it's lower. Let's just pick the average rent at $1,500 a month. It's not too high. It's, it's not, you know, you're not in class A, gated community, but you're not in a, the slums either. You're in a place, $1,500 a month, kind of like the apartments I was renting. I'm making $2,500. They're spending $1,500. Before we look at work or other assets, there is a $4,000 difference in our incomes without looking at work or assets, just based on where we live. That has a huge impact on your finances, which is why I suggest house hacking. And the first one might not look that great. The first duplex, like I said, I was paying, but you have to add the element of time. The first, and I don't, a lot of people, when they hear house hacking, they think, oh, I've been investing 10 times. I must have house hacked for one year, bought a property every year. That's not it. Two, I've house hacked twice, duplex and then fourplex. I might house hack one more time and use my VA loan. We'll see. I might not. I might not ever buy another property. My goal was financial freedom, not to build a big, huge, um, you know, real estate machine that just keeps growing. You know, make money to where it's just a thing and then share with people how I did that. Um, yeah, so it would have taken decades longer. It would have made financial freedom even harder because... It's very easy to reach financial freedom when you don't have a housing expense. And it's exponentially easier when your housing expense is negative $2,500 on just that one property. So I endorse it. Larry, perhaps a great video to do is a walkthrough when hunting for properties. Yes. And provide ongoing exterior and room to room comments on what you see when looking for and thinking under your REI cowboy hat, maybe. So I don't go to properties and look at, look for them. But if I get one under contract, I will definitely, I'll do a live stream there. I wasn't doing live streams for most of the purchases I've had. I just started doing these, but this is the 34th one, I think. Um, so that's not even a year. Uh, and ironically, my first live stream was me saying, here's why I don't do live streams. <laughs> But a live stream done through Zoom where I, once I figure out how to do that, which was actually the plan for tonight, but uh, then I can do a share, you know, share my screen and say, here's the email from my agent. Here's the, the listing of houses in my area. Here's why I'm able to immediately eliminate these ones from the thought process. And here's why these are the ones are going to take a deeper look. And this is what a deeper look means to me. I can absolutely do that. I'm probably going to do that either this week or on next week's live stream. Um, yeah, that is a great idea. I wanted to, I, I got the zoom set up now to where I can do shared screen. And, and cause I want to do the, I want to do a video this week, setting the rents on my vacant unit and literally go through, here's how I found it. Here's the flaw with rentometer. Here's why I'm setting my rents where they're at. Um, and talk about all of that with screen sharing too. So, Grissom, howdy. 30 days until I'll have my first house rented out. Congratulations. Moving in back with your mom rent free, making $700 cash flow to repeat. First one is the hardest. If this is your first one, you, all these things, there's a lot of things I like to say this in real estate oft is um, the first time you do something is very scary. The second time it feels like you could teach a course. Um, congratulations. Rinse and repeat. That's cool. Jeremy, vacancy walkthrough was good. Had some very similar thoughts. Planning on putting up a video of our duplex flip this week. Perfect. I look forward to that. That's cool. John, howdy. <laughs> Guildmaster for a raid guild is the new job. I was a uh, World of Warcraft guild leader with like 60 people just before the police academy. The, when I went to the police academy, it killed the guild. Um, that took more time, energy, and effort than a job did by far. Um, talk about gamers I can be the whiniest people. Um, yeah, maybe not. Dividend Dave, thank you for addressing the inspection report. I have a duplex under contract now and we'll be scheduling inspection shortly. Awesome. Nice. Arthur, howdy. I want to retire at 42, but I'm already 45. <laughs> well, it could be in my position. I could have retired at 48. And I'm retiring at 52. So I'm not sure which one of us got that wrong. 
William Craft. Howdy, I am retiring. Yes, so I uh, turned in my notice with the company owners this morning, um, had that conversation, which I think was about exactly as uncomfortable as I thought it was going to be. Because most people don't quit their job, they quit their bosses, right? They just can't stand their bosses, they want to leave. I really like my bosses. Like The people that own the company have been like family for a decade. Um, yeah, so it was, an, it was an uncomfortable conversation that needed to happen. Um, so, retired at 52. John, Texas, congratulations. I have a tenant who always pays the rent on time and is responsible. She hasn't paid rent this month and is not responding to me. Is it time to start the eviction process? Today is the fifth. So look at your lease. Um, most places have a grace period where the rent is due on this date. It's not late until in all of my leases, it's the first to fifth, except for one tenant gets paid on the third. So we, we do her rent on like it's due on the fourth. So she has the fourth to the ninth. It's like a five day period. So I don't know that you're at eviction stage yet. And depending on your lease and how much, how many days in grace you have. Um, it was the 4th of July holiday. Maybe they were traveling. I would get communication with them. Uh, and it's not so much to start the eviction process. It's that if, so my first tenant, I did not manage like a business. And every problem that I had with that tenant was my fault because I set it up. But since then, I'm very clear when I communicate with my tenants that I have an attorney on retainer. So you give like $1,500 for a retainer to an attorney in case you ever need to do an eviction. Uh, and even just getting them to send an email will cost you 150 bucks. But if your tenant is late, for me, I tell the tenants, since I communicate this way, I've actually never had a later missing rent payment. I tell the tenants, look, if it's late, I start the eviction process. I mean, if you want to communicate with me, we could see if I've never accepted a late payment. I've, I have had to educate somebody one time when they asked if they could pay their rent a week late. Um, and, and if you want to know, let me know in the comments. I'll explain to you why letting a tenant pay their rent a week late would be the worst thing for the tenant. Um, so what forms of communication have you tried with the tenant? Is it text? Is it email? In some places, text is not admissible. Is it email? Have you gone to the property? Do you have property management or is it you self-managing? Um, if they've paid on time in the past, how are they at, normally at communicating? And then are you past your grace period? If you're past the grace period, I think the communication would come from the attorney. People respond better to that, even though it might cost you some money. That is how I would handle that. Bolo. Howdy. Adam. The one who told me to go F myself. How does it feel? As good as you've imagined for the last 10 plus years? I don't know that it feels good yet. It's a surreal day that hasn't set in. It's kind of kind of like when we retire or when we take a vacation, the difference. A vacation has a return date. So even if you took, I'm going to take a six month sabbatical. You're, you're, you're off for six months. That's a vacation because it has a return date. When you go, um, so I've left some jobs before I've said some that were taken away that I didn't want to leave, like when I got laid off from law enforcement and when the recession hit, um, or when the company that I was at went on strike, like there's jobs that just got taken away. There was a return date because my brain goes, I have a CDL, I will have a job in a couple of days. My longest time without ever having a job was nine days. And that was from getting laid off from the police department. It took me a week, a week and two days to land the next job, um, which doubled my income. Um, and then they went on strike. But so I've, even when I left, lost a job or left a job, that was, this is just until I find the next one. This is not that at all. This is... Um, and I'm trying to think of an analogy that doesn't make me sound like a douche. <laughs> when you break up with someone, a lot of times it's a monkey branch. You know, people don't let go of this branch until they're holding onto this branch, right? So you leave somebody for someone else. Imagine if you left somebody and you said, look, there's no one else. You just suck so much. I'm leaving and I don't have anything else planned. It's a bad analogy. But I'm leaving a company not because they suck, not because I'm unhappy, but just because I can without a return date without a return date to another job, without a return date to that company. So that's the difference to the vacations or the job changes that I've had to today. So 
Don't know if it feels better. I know it feels different. Daniel Pitchler, <laughs> who is retiring in, on August 19th and tried to get me to wait until he was retired before I did it. But not today. Sorry, Dan. Beat you to it. Still doesn't make you happy. North Colorado Dawn. Howdy. Now the pressure is on for Matt to retire. Matt and Dan. Phil, in your experience, what renovations make the biggest difference with regard to rents? Almost none as far as renovations go. With regard to rents, in a Class A area, maybe it matters. My rentals are all in Class C, 1B minus. Tenants pay rents based on what they would pay for the place next door. You could have countertops, platinum coated, platinum, solid platinum, they wouldn't care. They wouldn't pay a dime more in rent. It's what does this many bedrooms in an area rent for? So to improve rents, I've added a bedroom. Or in this last case, I found a bedroom. <laughs> I didn't know it was there. Uh, but I have purchased before a duplex that had two bedrooms and a den on each side. That den was at a wall um, with a door power switch because the, the den had a closet. So it literally had everything two ways in and out now that I had it a wall with a door. Three bedroom rents out for more than a two bedroom. Tenants don't think in amenities. They don't think recessed lighting. They don't think splash wall behind the kitchen. They don't think stainless steel. They think bedroom count for class C areas. Uh, Section 8 only pays per bedroom, so it doesn't matter if you have a garage or a pool or a shed or anything like that. It's literally, they're going to go off bedroom count. Tenants don't think in square footage. That's an investor thought. When you see a two-bedroom that's 700 square, square feet or a two-bedroom that's 1,000 square feet to an investor, we're thinking, oh, okay, there might be a third bedroom in there to a renter. It's which one costs less. And it doesn't matter the size. To, to, to even that extreme. Um so renovations to increase rent, it's what you can add. You're turning a one and a half into a two full bath or, or one bath into a one and a half bath would have more impact than updating or upgrading the cabinets. Uh, that's the way I look at it. Matthew Lumberjack Landlord pretty much guts everything, does a full rehab flip, gets it all set up, doesn't, and he's doing it so he doesn't have to think about it for 20 or 30 years. And I have a friend who just did that with her duplex, like brand new cabinets, brand new counters. Perfect way to do it. She'll never have to think about that for 20 years. It's great. Not going to get you any more rent, but it's going to take away a lot of the stress of thinking, you know, when am I, because my places, have, some of my places have the original 1990, no, 1984 uh, cabinets and countertops. Like I've replaced sinks and faucets in those old countertops, get the same rent as if it was brand new granite countertops. They don't care. It's what would this rent out compared to what two places down, what would they rent it for? Um, so one of the mistakes that a lot of newer investors do is they upgrade a lot of little things that cost a lot of money and take a lot of work. It doesn't have the impact you're looking for. Um, Tony, howdy, and thank you, congratulations. But wait, all your other jobs got downsized. According to the man, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> Exactly. I'm doing it backwards. I don't have a pension. I'm, I'm, I have a little bit of money, a 401k that I don't know if I'm going to empty it out and just pay the penalty and pay the taxes or leave it in there for what now? Seven and a half, eight years, however long it is. Uh, I emptied it out when COVID hit because luckily we were impacted by COVID. So I was able to take out, I don't know, $84,000 without paying a penalty, just paid the taxes. And I took that money and I bought a triplex and it's making a crap ton of money. Um, it's actually in the triplex where I found out I have a two bedroom and not a one bedroom. Um, so I must be doing it wrong. RAI Stoners, isn't Matt going to buy a private jet first? <laughs> Maybe. He's going to get his Lamborghini when he finds somebody who's distressed and needs to sell. And he's going to get a Vegas winter home. Uh, I'm not sure about the jet thing, though. It's possible. Um, Julie, buy a house on a lake. I actually have a house on a lake. 
uh, it's rented to a Section 8 tenant and it's fully paid off and it's rented at 2200 a month. So in the back of my mind, I have a lake house, but it's paying me. So I don't live there. Um, but a house on a lake is an idea. Um, I think I'm going to travel too much to actually have a house to stay in. Um, I think house hacking and renting out a room in the unit that I have to additionally house hack so that there's someone there all the time, even when I'm traveling, is the better way to go for me. Um, each person is a little different, though. Jeremy. Your best working vacation, the beautiful lakes and ponds, Northeast Indiana. I got a great Airbnb or two for you here, you're my friend. <laughs> nice. I actually had a really cool person reach out to me today and say, hey, you're retiring. I have this vacation place that's on Airbnb. Just tell me what days and we'll book it out for you with no charge. So if you're watching this, thank you very much. Um, Victor, howdy, and thank you. Angelina, howdy. Congratulations. What kind of appliances do you recommend for your rental? It, uh, I think traveling and unique background will grow your YouTube channel even quicker. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, the background changes will be different when it's, the map is usually to hide whether I'm at work or at home or traveling. But if I'm gonna be traveling with different backgrounds, I think that'll work too. Um, I just did a live stream in Juno, which I think actually came out pretty well. Um, so appliances for the for refrigerators, I like to go to Lowe's or Home Depot uh, and get something seven or eight hundred dollars. I don't do anything fancy. It's class C. If I had class B or A and you needed the double sided fridge to make it match or water into it or whatever, yeah, I would I would have a specific brand. But I go and I look at for what's on sale. What really matters to me is that the dishwasher, the stove, and the refrigerator are close to the same, either white, stainless, or black. I try not to go black because once it gets dirty, it looks, um, and the, the refrigerator at least looks really bad if it gets even just dust on it, but white or stainless, as long as they're the same. Like I, I was looking at my, uh, my walkthrough for this current vacancy and the stove looks good. The dishwasher, I'm probably going to replace it. Uh, I've got a white, a white one that's in good shape to put in there. And I thought oh, I'll probably replace the refrigerator. And I think in that video, I said, I'm probably going to go stainless because it's only like a $20 difference, but then it won't be the same as the stove. The stove is white. So I'm probably going to actually buy another white replacement refrigerator for that at Lowe's or Home Depot based on whatever when I walk in what's on sale that month I don't really have a preference again it's it's not where you live it's where a tenant lives and what the what the tenant sees when they come in the first time is what they're going to expect um, I have purchased used stoves and a long time ago I was providing washers and dryers I don't do that anymore now I make sure there's a washer dryer hookup and tenants provide their own washer and dryer I have an old set a washer and dryer that I keep in a shed in case I have a tenant that I want to approve, but they don't have a set. They're allowed to use this one that a previous tenant left behind and that I don't repair or maintain or replace if it breaks, but they can use it until they get their own and then I'll put mine back in the shed. Um, and they're just an old set. They're nothing fancy and that probably not even matched, but they, they do what you push the button and it cleans and you push the button and it dries, right? Um, yeah. That was a good question. Thank you. William, are you thinking of doing a mentorship program now? I don't know about mentorship or coaching. I think I'm going to do book and then course um, and then continue to do this live streams type stuff uh, at least once a week where I answer questions as, as much as I can. And sometimes you know, I might have to take a note and go look up a question and come up with an answer later. Um, but for the most part, when it comes to real estate, I, I keep most of this Top of mind awareness. Every now and then a question will come in and I'll say, that is a great question for Matt the Lumberjack Landlord's product review or Millennial Mike's investing at a distance or you know somebody who does the thing that the question is about that might not be my specialty. Um, yeah. Sean, howdy. Enjoy your retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Paula, howdy. Congratulations. Thank you. Angelina, what do you make sure your tenant isn't destroying? Wait, no. What do you do to make sure your tenant isn't destroying your property? Do you do inspections? If it's a Section 8 tenant, I usually don't bother because the state's going to inspect once or once a year or every other year here in this area. And Section 8 tenants in our area take really good care of the property because they don't want to lose the benefit. It's like a five-year wait to get back on the list for, for the voucher program here. With some of my units... I will do a kind of walkthrough, either me or a handyman, 
where we walk through and we check things like the banister. I'm not more worried about that than them trashing the property. Um, and the excuse I'll use sometimes is I'll, I'll take the air filters for the HVAC system. I'll bring in four and I'll say, here, I'm going to put one in today, but here's three for you to use for the other quarters of the year. I'll be back next year. Uh, almost all new investors have these two concerns. First, what if somebody trashes my place? And second, what if I have a vacancy? So my live stream in Juno was actually, what if I have a vacancy? So that's a recent live stream you can look up. But on the, what if somebody trashes your place? The way I was able to get past that is by taking the, the strategy my brother uses. He has 10 paid off rentals. Seven of them are mobiles. And then, then three are stick builds. He just, he says, I plan, like I expect my tenants to trash the property. I expect holes in the walls, doors broken, cabinets shattered, windows cracked. I mean, everything, cement down the drain, everything you can imagine. And so I have reserves to handle that type of repair if the tenant moves out. So I'm not physically going in there and putting in new pipes because there's cement down the drain. A plumber is, and here's what the expense would be. So you have the reserves set there for that. So that if you watch my most recent vacancy walkthrough, it just came out last weekend, the place was spotless. They're getting their full deposit back. I'm not charging for anything. I have to switch out the blinds because they're old. Um, and I don't, they, they might've broke 10 years ago, but the tenant was there for like four years. There's nothing wrong with it. I was expecting trashed place, holes in everything. Need to replace every the cabinets, trashed, countertop burnt, scorched, cracked, whatever. So when it's not, you're happy. That's, that's how I look at that. Expect it to be, but you don't live there. You don't live inside until they move out and you have to get it ready for the next person. It doesn't matter how they live inside there and have reserves and the skill set to find a contractor for flooring and find a contractor for cabinets and find a contractor for paint. You know, using I use the Thumbtack app, but as you develop relationships with contractors over years, you might just go to the same ones to where there's no stress. I just expect it to be terrible. And when it's not, that's a, that's cool. Um, and I generally put tenants in place who have, so I've never asked or cared what their income is, but my screening criteria is no evictions ever. I don't want somebody in a property who's ever learned that you can make a landlord carry you for several months. So I don't care if the eviction was in 1980, and I'm not going to approve it if I find out about it. And I, I require a 700 or higher credit score. Even my Section 8 tenants, I have Section 8 tenants with an 831 credit score. People who have worked at and got their credit score high will protect it. So if they do trash the place and you can document it, you can hit them with a judgment there, you know, that, that type of person generally takes care of a place. So when they move out, you're not going to use up more than their deposit to fix it. Um, so it hasn't really been a problem. I have high screening criteria. Tom, start your own property management company. That is what Matt is doing, but I don't want a job. I, I self-manage my rental units, it takes maybe two hours a month. But if I was to do this for someone else's property and to add to that, uh, that's still a job. That is, that person who owns that property is then my boss, which I'm not looking to have a boss. I've had a boss since I was eight and I'm ready to never do that again. Um, yeah, even if I hired somebody to be a property manager, that's a possibility. Um, I don't know that it's worth that amount of effort. It's too easy to manage properties once they're up and running. Even a tenant flip like the one I'm doing now, I'm probably going to go to the property twice. I'm probably going to talk to a handyman once. Um, and I may meet somebody to sign a lease. To me, that's not worth creating a $30,000 a year salary for somebody. Um, milestone. Howdy. Milestones to millions. Congrats on retirement. Thank you. And Semper Fi. Can you give some insight as to how you saved for your first purchase? Um, slowly. I was making $17 an hour, a single parent with three kids with a lot of bad debt, I was living in a house, moved into an, a house or moved into an apartment and rented out the house, which didn't cash flow for the first year. Worked overtime saved what I could, had a side hustle where I was playing World of Warcraft and selling things on eBay and on um, some uh, farming websites where they take game resources. So that was three, maybe 500 on a good month, three to $500 a month. 
saved everything for two years. It took two years with overtime, side hustle. And once I finally got the house to cash flow, to save up a little over $20,000 to have the down payment for the first duplex, which was a 5% down conventional loan. Uh, yeah, time. It took time. It took two years of making lunch, being frugal, driving 15 to 20 year old cars. I mean, the, the first five years are very different than the last five years. Um, and then it took two years again to save the down payment for the next one, even though the house was cash flowing more. I started making more money at the company. I was house hacking and added to my savings. It was a little over two years till that next one, and then a little less than two years, and then about a year, and then paid off a property. And then it just starts to snowball and get faster and faster. I mean, to the point now where. So I, if you take out YouTube and you take out, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an expert witness testimony, which takes up you know maybe 10 hours a year um, to make several thousand dollars. So like if you take out the side hustles and it was just rental profit, it's about 14,000 a month. I spend about three and, and that's even trying, right? So there's 10 or $11,000 coming in that will be saved for the next investment. I'm probably going to try to learn how to spend more and take more trips and more vacations. I probably won't do a cruise, but you know, a, a cruise once a month maybe. Um, I would still have $5,000 a month coming in to save from the income snowball. That's $60,000 a year towards the next investment, which I'm not trying to add investments on. Um, I am trying to get as many of you as possible to the income snowball so you can have those same problems. And my chat moved, which I appreciate. Um, I lost my spot, which is beautiful. Thank you. This means there's more comments, which is good. Hard to get a live stream to go on as long as we like to do. Me and Matt are doing usually three hours. I don't know if we're going to be able to do that going on forever, but the questions are the only reason we can do that. Here we go. Okay. Andre, howdy. If you invest out of state, will you keep your local properties? You mentioned you're only looking for financial freedom, which doesn't mean 1,000 units. Are you pivoting? I was answering an out-of-state investing question. I'm not currently looking to invest out-of-state. They asked if I moved out-of-state, would I keep my local ones? Um, so I'm not looking to do that. Um, I've looked at some other markets for friends. I have some friends in Florida, so I went and I looked at their market too to try to give them some guidance. I looked at Arizona when we were looking at putting a campus there, and I looked in Idaho, and then the worst winter in 10 years happened, so I'm not buying in Idaho. Um, I don't want 1,000 units. I'm not even sure I want 16 units. It's entirely possible that I might sell my single family house and use that money. There's enough of that to pay off two of the mortgages on duplexes, which would reduce my unit count from 16 to 15, but increase my cash flow a couple thousand dollars a month. One less place to, to manage and more cash flow. Don't know that I'll do that, but it's, it's on the list of possibilities. Uh, it's hard to make a decision when both outcomes are positive. Uh, so I'm not pivoting. I'm not looking to invest out of state. I was just answering an out of state question. And thank you. Invest. Howdy. Central Virginia. So there's North Dakota, South Dakota, North Carolina, South Carolina, West Virginia, Virginia, and Central Virginia. Is there a new one? I went to school in America and they don't teach us stuff like this. Um, Cool. Millennial health and mindset. Appreciate it. It's in Portland and you have considered property management. No, oh, there you go. Invest Lynchburg. If I am looking to house hack with a multifamily two to four in October, November, should I start looking at contacting owners now to build a relationship with them? I would like to creatively finance the property. I would check out um, Cody and Christian's multifamily strategy. They're, they're, their whole system is built on building relationships with owners who then want to sell. Every property I've purchased has been from the MLS using traditional lending. So I'm making seller financing offers with my deals now, but I hadn't purchased any like that before. Mine are just, I find them on the MLS, I make offers, I buy them, I get a loan, I close, it's done. I was doing it with a full-time W-2. If you're looking at building relationships with owners, I would look at 
Cody and Christian's multifamily strategy. It's a YouTube channel. They have a course. Um, they're killing it. They're adding, they're over a hundred units now, um, all built on seller financing, all looking at, you know, building the relationship with the people who own it and then how that conversation goes. Um, I think they would be a good resource for you if that's what you're looking to do. And if you're looking at doing it then, the sooner you start building the relationship, the better. I don't think it could hurt. Aaron, howdy, welcome back. Aaron Michelle and Corpus Christi. Nice, my niece just moved to Texas. She told me where to. It's not too far, it's like an hour from the coast. I should know these things. Uh, Daniel, <laughs> next chapter. Don't worry, Daniel, you are retiring on August 19th. I hope you make it. John Williams, howdy. Leaving the core job reduces the snowball. True. Was the factor that your next asset you hope to replace that income? No. Um, I don't know that I want to add more assets. I might. I might just because I have the money to put to work. Once your income from passive income is five times your living expenses and you're going to have to think of ways to spend the money. We, we, we go through this growth of before we even understand finances. So up until 40, I probably never had a thousand dollars in the bank, but since 40, I've been focused on fixing my finances. But so since from 40 till now, so for 12 years now, cause I'm 52, every penny that came in was saved for the next investment. So make as much as possible, reduce the expenses, save and invest the difference. Everything that went in there was saved for, for the next investment. At financial freedom, which happened four years ago, I didn't need any more. For four years, I've kept adding. So I had multiples of my, you know, it takes me three. If I tried, I could probably spend 5,000 a month. Um, and I'll learn how to spend more. That's a skill I have to develop. But there's over 14,000 coming in right now without having to get out of bed. And it's... <laughs> And it's going up. I went and did a walkthrough this last weekend on a place I thought was going to be a single bedroom. Single bedroom, uh, And I thought, okay, I was told there's a den or a family room, so I'll probably be able to turn this into a two-bedroom. And it actually was a two-bedroom that they had been using one of the rooms like a den. And the guy that did the inspection just called it that. It has a closet, two ways in and out. I mean, it is literally a bedroom. I won't have to do anything. I was expecting just to spend five to $10,000 to make it a second bedroom. So now instead of, you know, this amount for rent, it's going to be this amount for rent with people fighting over it. Um, rents keep going up. Mortgages pretty much stay the same. I will probably add more assets just because I have to do something with the money. Not because I need to replace the W. I haven't touched a penny from my W-2 job since 2018. Every penny since then has gone save for the next investment. I haven't, I don't even know what my paychecks were. I know they went into an account and I watched what that account did over time because there was all the rents going in there too, but I have no idea what I was making. Um, so I wouldn't even know what to replace. So no, that wasn't a factor, John. It's, it's just once you're financially free, money is just a thing. So yeah, I, I'm not stupid. I'm not going to build up a bunch of money in the, in the, in the bank. I'm not going to go and, I might go buy a boat, but my plan is not to just buy a boat because I have money. I'll have all this money and I'll buy another asset. And I might I might at some point go, okay, so this is the healthcare asset. This is the transportation asset. This is the food asset. These five other properties are the dating asset. But I might go, okay, so this is the, the next one I buy. I'll buy the boat duplex. The cash flow from this will be the amount that I can pay for a slip and a boat and the registration and the upkeep. Whatever that amount is, that's how much boat I can afford. Maybe. Don't know if I'm even not lazy enough to do that. Uh, yeah, it's a weird switch. The, I think the hardest thing is going from every penny goes for the next investment to I'm actually going to start spending money. I have no idea what that's going to look like yet. I look forward to making each video, explaining it, though. Uh, REI Stoners, will you be at the Tacoma Fi next week? My plan is to be there. I will be doing a live stream next Tuesday. Uh, it's the second Tuesday of the month. Tacoma Fi group meets up. Um, we usually meet around six, so it'll be about an hour and a half live stream. So it's the one time of the month where I do a shorter version, hour and a half short. I want to be there. Yeah. Keith, howdy. I want to show you how I'm running my numbers and see if you can improve your strategy. Happy to take a look. So if you're there next Tuesday, 
bring um, bring what you have. You can probably just look on your phone. Um, works for me. Flash of light. Howdy. Any danger of a reverse house hack that costs you money in retirement? Example include an elderly and sick parent moving into your house or adult children moving back in with you, no rent. So if your parents are still alive, mine, mom, I miss you. Dad, I miss you too. Uh, not so much. My kids, it was happy 18th birthday. Here's your restraining order. Probably not going to happen. Um, that's why, and I think David Green nails this from Bigger Pockets. He had a video that came out about three months ago where he said, don't retire on cash flow. So, of course, my little radar went up saying, what? That's like the purpose of cash flow. Um, he said, if you need $5,000 a month, and he used different numbers. So this is just the version of what he said. If you need $5,000 a month to live and you get cash flow up to $5,000 a month and you retire, that's stupid. What if your mom and dad get sick and move in? What if your kids lose their job, move in with no rent? What if you get sick and your healthcare costs go up? What if inflation happens? Like what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, right? But if you need $5,000 a month to survive and you have $20,000 coming in, now you can retire because parent can move in, kid can move in, your health concerns can be covered. Inflation is a factor that probably helps you because your assets improve, your rents go up. Um, yeah, so for me, not a concern, and, and not because I don't have parents to worry about. Um, no, the big, the biggest threat to, to my existence is um, <laughs> women. Uh, but I can avoid them. I'm trying. Invest in Lynchburg. Did I hear that you're right? You finally pulled the trigger. Awesome. Great job, Dion. Have some skull vodka to celebrate. I should do that. It's been an hour and a half. That's just water. That's just water. Yes, you did hear that right. Pulled the trigger today, had the conversation with the owners of the company this morning. Um, been thinking about retiring for a while. Been wondering what it would look like. And I remember Michael Zuber saying, we're all one bad day at work away from quitting. He went in at eight o'clock in the morning, was expecting to keep working. Bosses put some stuff on his desk that he didn't like, that he told him he didn't like, and they said, deal with it. And he quit. 8.45, he left, right? It's the version I remember. Um, Matt hasn't had that yet. I went in, had a great day. Like the company had a problem for the last month or so. And in, for, in that month, I kept thinking, I'm not going to pile on the bosses. Like, I'm retiring while we have this problem. I will not quit with this problem in existence. And it was like a physical attack on the company. This morning, we had a meeting where it, it took meeting with an attorney and strategizing and me refreshing my mind on what the read interrogation and, and interview techniques are to get my information right, to present it in such a way where I, I literally flipped an opponent to our side and solved the problem. Then I quit. Like I had a great day at a job I like. And then I was like, hey, you got you know the Zoom meeting's over. Can can the two of you hang out and we'll just have one more Zoom meeting? I love it. They're like family. It's been a great job. But life, we are more than our jobs. So even if you have a job you love and something you like doing, time freedom. It wins out. And in my case, if you have, haven't been watching my stuff invest, if this is your first time here, I, I think I've seen your name before. Um, I'm walking away from $2 million golden handcuffs and it's just gone. Still worth it. Time freedom is that important. Um, you can buy a lot of skull vodka with $2 million, probably three or four bottles. Um, Keith. That gum, you beat me to retirement. I'm retiring into my rentals. Awesome. Nice. I can tell you it's, it's, uh, well, I'm not even done working yet, so I can't say it's been four hours or something, but um, I think it's worth it. <laughs> Chester, that's actually a great question, Dion. Why would it be bad for the tenant to ask to pay their rent late? My guess is they knew the circumstances that would cause them to not have their rent on time. Okay. Here's, here's the explanation why you don't ever want your tenant to pay their rent one week late. I should make a separate video for this. 
And I said it like that because I think I'll remember it, but you guys know my memory. I won't remember this. So here's your chance to hear this. Most tenants, most people live paycheck to paycheck. There's some statistic where, you know, six figure earners, like a third of them live paycheck to paycheck. So we're not making six figures. There's people living paycheck to paycheck. Living paycheck to paycheck, renters have on average four weeks to save up the rent for next month. They're living paycheck to paycheck. That's four weeks to accumulate, whether they're paid Friday or every other week or whatever, to accumulate the rent for next month. Four weeks. Take one away because they're late this week. This is the week where you gave them a grace period. So for last month, they needed five weeks to get their rent together. So now for next month, this person living paycheck to paycheck has three weeks to save up the rent that last month took them five weeks to put together. You're setting your tenant up for failure because you're greatly reducing the, the time span for their next rent payment. And that, that 40 seconds that I just did is the conversation I had with the tenant when they asked to pay the rent late. And then they quickly said, oh, I don't want to do that. Let me figure out how to get it, which meant they had other things they prioritized over their rent and were hoping I was just a super nice guy and would let them take the weekend trip or the whatever so their rent could be a week late. And then they realized that this will be a reverse income snowball and next month will be harder, which means they might need a week or two and then harder and then they're evicted. So if you let them pay a week late and then you end up having to evict that tenant three months later, that is the owner's fault. So that's why. Chester, I guess the dating perennial monkey branching. Always fun. I'm sure you can sense the enthusiasm from your post. I'm sure I can. Clinton. Howdy. So now you could start your own driving school. Uh, well, I could. It was a truck driving school um, for about the, well, about half what it cost to buy a duplex. I could start a truck driving school. I could totally do it. I could nail it. Uh, no, not gonna. That's a job. Even owning that kind of company. Um, I'm not an entrepreneur. The reason I was able, one of the reasons I was able to grow the company so well from six staff to 60, I mean, one location to five, was I was doing it for someone else. Like I, I talk about it all the time and people don't believe me because it sounds like I'm busy, but I'm super lazy. Like the reason I want to invest is so I don't have to work. If I could run a company like a truck driving school, but it was for me, I would go, how much do I need to grow it to where I'm financially free? That'd be my limit. Since I was growing it for two other people who gave me a shot and I felt like this reciprocity, I owed them. I worked harder than I ever would work for myself doing that. I am not an entrepreneur. I'm an investor. So I don't see me starting a truck driving school or a driving school in the future, especially a driving school because that's mostly teenagers, right? And kids are demons. Uh, Keith, every day is a good day to build a relationship. Absolutely. You never know who you will walk in the you never know who will who you will walk in their path or they will walk in yours. True. Invest Lynchburg. Thanks, Dion. I got to go. Ciao. I'll watch the replay tomorrow at work. I suggest double speed or one and a half speed because I talk slow. Monica, howdy. And thank you. you. Earned it. I just started following you this year and I hope to retire one day. Okay, you've got this. I have faith in you. I think you already know what your purpose is and that you're helping people with the knowledge you have. That is what I'm hoping for. Angel, I can attest to that. I have a duplex with four skylights and a unique yard design, which cost me money to maintain. My other duplex rents for about the same and it's nowhere as nice. Yep, awesome. Thank you. Rich, howdy. Really cool, congrats, thank you. Lumberjacks, not buying a jet. Yes, Lambo. Yes, Vegas house. And I will want to come and sleep on your couch every now and then. Um, every day in Vegas, your opportunity gets better. Nice. Yeah. Every 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 day that inventory is building there. Esther, howdy. Is it worth the investment installing fence, sod, and irrigation? Are you in class A, class B, class C? Um, which I see is the next question. Um, super fancy. It might matter. I have a friend who has 30 rent 30 rentals. He's retired. He's been retired for probably four or five years now. Um, he had one rental that he, he, he had a koi pond, a little wood bridge. It was all amazing, but tenants in there, they trashed it. 
All of his places now are basically gravel up to the house. You get no more rent, no matter how nice the yard looks. Um, I live in Washington state, so we don't have the irrigation problem. Our problem is keeping the plant life away from the house more than, than getting stuff to grow. So it could depend on where you're at. If it's a rental for me, uh, if I was in Arizona, the limited amount of grass that I can have, the better. I would have that fake grass stuff outside in a heartbeat, even in Scottsdale. That's what my friend did at his place. Like $2.3 million house put in fake grass. That would be better, especially for a tenant. Remember, a lot of tenants can choose an apartment or your place. They choose your place because they want a yard. They don't choose your place because they want to maintain a yard. They want a place for the kids or the dog to play that's fenced, maybe a little more parking access, stuff like that. But they're not looking for stuff to maintain. If you're going to put it in, you're not going to get any more rent. Nice lawn is not going to increase. increase if you're in an HOA, you should sell the place and buy something else anyways. Uh, anyway, but um, so no, I don't think I would do that. I, I have never done it on any of my places. Uh, my brother hasn't done it on his. He's got some in California. Uh, no. Sorry. Millennial health and mindset. How do you define class A, B, or C? So there's a really good article by Brandon Turner. If you just Google class property classes A, B, and C, Brandon Turner, it'll come up. And the really simple breakdown is class A is uh, very expensive. Your $500 a night plus hotel type living places, your gated communities, your um, all high-end appliances and a super nice area. Um, class B is your single family houses that are like McMansions, bigger, nicer, super clean areas. Kids can play out on the street without anybody worrying. Class C is your working class where your, your, your blue collar workers live, um, where there's probably just as many tenants as there are owners in an area. Um, Class D is a war zone. So war zone is you can't go there safely. The cops don't go there alone. They go there in pairs. Uh, you can generally tell if you're next to a Panera Bread or something like that, you're probably class C. If you're next to a 7-Eleven, you're probably class D. Uh, so the types of businesses that are in the area. Um, there's no clearly defined A, B, C, or D. It's for me, C, the reason it makes sense, the reason I want to invest in class C is I don't want to invest in D because if I can't go there safely, like, like without a vest and a partner, uh, I don't want to own there. I don't even want to send a property manager there to deal with tenants. I wouldn't want the tenants that I'm renting to to live there, right? I don't want class A because in the history of the record keeping for rents in the United States, which started in 1914, we have never once in a five-year period had rents decrease. Not once. Over from 1914 until now, rents have gone up every year. Except 2009, Class A properties. This is why if you look at the chart for 2009, it looks like rents dipped. And that's because Class C and B went up. There was more demand because people who went through foreclosures and lost their houses had to rent a house. They weren't going out and renting in a gated community with a four-car garage and an air-conditioned shop, right? They were they were looking at just buying, renting a house. Demand increased for B and C. But Class A dipped enough to where it looks like there was an overall dip in rents, even though B and C went up. So in hard economic times, in the worst housing crash in my memory, rents went up in the property class that I'm looking for. That's why I look for Class C. Um that's the Cliff Notes version of the difference. And like, again, it's not defined, but Brandon Turner has a pretty good write-up article on it. Angel R. And then my chat moved. Which I love. There we go. Angela, uh, Whirlpool GE and Frigidaire are good. There you go. And that's generally what I find at Lowe's and Home Depot. Um, yeah. Chester. Shameless plug for Matt, the Lumberjack Landlord's product review series, Pure Gold. I second that. I've talked about it a little bit earlier in this video. Um, it's not something that I'm going to do. Uh, I'll do a few things like these are the locks I use. This is the light I use. I don't do the repairs myself. I don't select the materials. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to go and pick out flooring uh, for LVP for this one unit. But Matt has done dozens, like 50 plus, that's dozens, 50 plus rehabs on his units. So his product reviews, I'm watching those. Um, he buys locks that I don't like. <laughs> I just literally bought locks about two today for my new um, uh, vacancy that I just did the walkthrough on this last weekend. And I got the ones that I like, but you know, to each his own. Um, 
Angel R. KitchenAid cooktops are great if you find a good deal. Yep. Kelly, howdy. I got a VA rate of 4.375 today. Good. Can't believe it as my other lender charges one point to get your 5%, but I'm scared to change lender. I am one month out from closing. Um, check your closing date with your lender and see if they think that there was anything that can cause a problem there. And if you're looking at going from conventional to VA, the thing with VA is to make sure that it's it's livable. Like you have to have straps on your water heater. All flooring has to be done. Every window and door has to function properly. So if you've had the inspection already, you'll know. VA is like FHA. There's a few more hoops to jump through. They're not much, but they're, they're just a few things that could delay closing. Um, but check with your lender if they think they can meet the closing date that's already scheduled. Angel R, now that you're retired, do you see yourself being more hands-on with renovations? No. <laughs> no. Um, no. That's a great question. I think I've asked myself that question. It's like, hey, I can be working. I can't, no, I'm gonna have a handyman do that. I like my handyman being happy. So whenever I have work, I wanna make sure they get it. Like, I'm excited that I have a handyman finishing a tenant clip for a friend. As he's wrapping up, I have one coming. I'm going to go, hey, look, let's go. We're going to meet there, I think, Friday. And we're going to go, give me a quote. Like, I could tear the carpet out. I could take the carpet to the dump. What would you charge for it? I could, there's very little paint repair to do. Just a little bit in the bathroom. I've already got the paint. I went and bought the materials. I got the blinds. I could, I could screw in blinds, right? But I want the handyman to give me his quote. And me to go, oh, okay, that seems fair. And you talked me into it, whatever. Give him the work. So that in two months when I'm in Thailand and sober enough to see what's on my phone. I can send a message to my handyman, which is probably gonna be 10 o'clock at night here and going, here's the issue I need you to go and handle. And because they remember that there was a bunch of stuff I could have done myself, but I gave them the work. It was the easy stuff I could do myself, not just always the what's in the crawl space with the spiders. You're doing that. I'm doing all the easy stuff. I literally give them all the work and tip them. Then my system works so that I only have the two hours a month because I can rely on my handyman to do that kind of stuff. So no, I don't, I don't see me being more hands-on with renovations. Um, it was important when I first started investing, I did a lot of work with my handyman. I went out with him. I was like, oh, this whole deck kind of needs rebuilt, like not torn down and rebuilt, but the outer edge, the, the pylons, all this kind of stuff, stuff I didn't know. Uh, so I worked with him. Once we did one, I was like, okay, so now I know what's a fair amount of work, how long this is going to take. You should charge for this much labor for it. Um, I understood it. I'm not going to do it, but when I'm getting an estimate on something like that, I have a better concept of what it should be. Um, that was in the beginning. And also money was tighter then. As the income snowball kicks in, like I said, I'm happy. I want my agents to make a commission. I want my handymen to get work. I want them to come to me because I'm the person that helps them have work. So, uh, that all sounded believable, right? You guys, you guys know it's just because I'm lazy. <laughs> like, like that's true. I'm just super lazy. I'm like, I can watch Stranger Things because in the last episode, Harper goes, but not today. And that's going to be in a video. Um, or I can go do handyman stuff. No. Uh, great question, though. <laughs> Thanks, Julius. Wait, no, that was Angel. Julius, howdy. Do you still recommend the one rental at a time course for new investors as you don't have one out yourself? I believe when I have one out myself, I might still recommend this because mine is going to be very specific to if you want to do buy and hold small multifamily, how the, the binder method works, how, you know, all, all, all of the strategies that I've used. His, he's got lenders, he's got investing at a distance, he's got self-managing, he's got house hacking. It's like, 7,000 videos on his channel and his course is less than 500 bucks. There, there are courses that are two, $3,000 that I haven't taken. And I don't even know if I would recommend. Right. Um, so I think I'm still going to recommend his, and I don't know for sure if I'm doing a course because I'm available Tuesdays for three hours to answer questions. I have the videos on my channel. I mean, yeah, I, I'm human. I would like to monetize this. That'd be great. Um, but right now, I think all of the information I have is available here. And I don't need a course. 
as there's more and more videos, um, and as if eventually the channel grows enough to where it's hard to get all the questions answered, a, a course might make more sense. Um, but for now, I would still recommend a one rental at a times course. Um, Matthew, howdy. So I got a call from the VA today trying to convince me it was a good idea to refinance your primary from the VA. The VA called you? You mean a lender called you and tried to trick you into using your VA loan again. Uh, currently paying 2.79 on 283, two years old. Payment is currently 1750 a month. They want to reset you with 30 years, pull out 50,000 at 5%, 3,330, a new payment would be 2150. It's going to help you to refinance 23 at two points uh, just to get 50K. I guess lost brain cells. <laughs> Whoever was trying to talk you into that, uh, you're, you're creating debt on an existing asset. You're worsening, you're, you're losing your, your, your best asset right now is that low fixed rate loan. Um, and the question before you ever pull money out of something is what would you do with it? So if you're going to sell something, cash out, refinance, or home equity line of credit, the first question is, do I have a place to deploy these funds that will generate a good enough to return to justify that purchase and the added debt on the existing asset. And, and I, I don't see in any way that you would, unless you could somehow get like a 50% return on some project somewhere, maybe, but that's the question. Do you have a place to deploy the funds? Is there a reason to even do that? And the worst thing that lenders are gonna be talking people into right now is possibly an adjustable rate mortgage. But the second worst thing is they're gonna say, you have all this consumer debt, you have a car loan, you have a personal loan, you have these credit cards, which are unsecured debt, and they want to turn that into a long-term, better payment, like the payment will look better, but it's fixed rate, long-term debt, now backed by an asset. That's the dumbest thing to do. Uh, no, I would not do that. It does not sound like something I would do. Antoine, howdy. Just got on. Did you retire already? I turned in my notice today, had the conversation with the owners. And it was a weird conversation. It's been a weird day. Feels weird. I'm not sure what the timeline is. It can be tomorrow. It could be a couple of weeks. It could be a couple of months. I've been training the people to replace me for a couple of years. So there's a couple last things to touch on. And then I think I'm just going to slowly kind of stop coming in less and less and less until I fade away and I'm not there. I'm still available um, for free. I told them I consult on anything they need going forward. I want to make sure that they have a chance for success. I'm not leaving the company because I'm unhappy. I've been treated super fair. I love the owners like family I'm better because my family sucks. But um, I'm not quitting because of anything that they've done. I'm just quitting because I reached financial freedom and I, and I want to enjoy the next you know, the decade, instead of thinking of in my 50s as I kept running a company or I took my 50s and professional term, goofed the F off, travel, enjoy life, do whatever. Wasn't that hard of a choice, even for a job I like. I was having fun there. I still enjoy the job. Um, but yeah, I have officially turned in the retirement package, which is what you would say in the military. But here it was just like, <laughs> I'm out of here. How do you want this to go? And I'm trying to do it in such a way to set them up for success. Like they, they gave me a shot. No one else ever did. And let me run this for the last 10 plus years. Um, yeah, I've been happy there. I have a feeling I'm going to be happy without an alarm clock or responsibility. Um, a lot of responsibility. And uh, if you, if you missed earlier, Anton, I'm actually walking away from $2 million golden handcuffs. While I work there, if they ever sold the company, I would get 10% of the sale, which would be about $2 million because their valuation is $20 million. If I quit and walk away, I get nothing. And I'm okay with that. Um, sometimes freedom is more important than money. <laughs> I wish I could say that to my 40-year-old self. I would punch me. Um, Matthew. Howdy. Look out. The shady loan officers are already on the prowl. Yeah. I, I, I like to watch Matt Gouge, the um, Matt, the mortgage guy. He is actually really good at saying, here's what a loan officer would say if they're trying to talk you into a bad product. Like he, I watch his channel 
and I, like every time I think I'm going to go and talk to a lender, I watch his channel for a couple of days before to kind of refresh. Um, he shares good behind the scenes mortgage loan world stuff. It's called Matt the Mortgage Guy. If you get a chance to check it out. Um, Angel R, looking back, would you have paid off your first rental property? Yes, I did. I, I paid off my first rental property. Um, it had an interest rate above 6% at a time where refinances would have been 6%. So refinancing would have reset the loan a little bit, made it longer, maybe brought down the payment a little. It was my smallest one. I only owed 121,000 on it. Uh, it's a single family house, rents out for 2,200. That peace of mind that comes from having that paid off and the rental income coming in. Matt and Mike tried to talk me into refinancing, pulling out cash last year, 2020, when it would have been probably three, three and a half percent to pull any out and have it ready to deploy now. But I'm glad I didn't. I would have less cash flow, more money to deploy, which would eventually equal more cash flow. But my goal isn't more units. My goal was enough money to make work optional, which happened in 2018. Uh, and it's gotten better since then. Um, I will have a much more comfortable retirement than I ever would have thought I was going to have um, just by working four years longer than I probably needed to. I think I missed a couple of questions. If I ever miss something that you say, I try to read everything. Please just say it again. So you can go retire. Jonathan, how, how many properties total? Seven. One single family house that's paid off. Four duplexes. House, duplexes, triplex, fourplex. Seven properties, 16 rental units. Um, living in a unit of the fourplex, rent out the other room because I travel a lot and I always want somebody to be here. So technically house hacking two different ways. Um, by, you know, living in a unit, renting out the others, but renting out a room in my unit as well. Um, just transparent numbers. So 16 rental units. I've never done a cash out refinance. I've never taken out a home equity line of credit. I've never sold the recycle capital. I just save down payments by the next property, um, which greatly increases your cash flow. I mean, I have less units than I could have. I could have a lot more units, but my cash flow would be less. Um, with 16 rental units, the cash flow every month is a little over 14,000. I have a couple side hustles. I make about 500 bucks a month off of YouTube. Yeah, yeah I could totally retire. Um, somewhere between one and $2,000 a month from the Am uh, Amazon uh, affiliate program. So if you ever see the videos where I talk about my locks or my likes or my lights or whatever, there is a way to make money off of that. Um, and I'm an expert witness for court cases that involve transportation, CDLs, or anything that I've ever worked in, which is something I suggest most people do. Whatever field you've worked in, reach out to this thing called the Expert Institute and get on their list of expert testimony for if you've worked in IT or sales or whatever. There's a court case somewhere in the country that will involve your skill set. And then you charge a retainer and you charge by the hour. So I, I get like uh, usually $1,000 or $1,500 retainer, and then I charge $150 an hour, which very rarely happens. Um, you get your retainer and then you probably handle three or four emails to give an expert's opinion. Um, probably takes about 10 hours a year to do this. And I make on average between 15 and $20,000 a year from that. Um, I don't know that I will ever stop doing that because it's just so easy. And one time, so two times I've been deposed. Yeah, it takes more time. One time went to trial, um, which does take more time. But then you hit the $150 an hour to go sit in a courtroom. Um, but to retire, uh, 2018, work became optional with four properties, seven units once the house was paid off. Income was more than what I was making as a police officer, and I didn't have a mortgage because I was house hacking. Um, but now cash flow is um, it's not as good as Michael Zuber's or Matt the Lumberjack Landlords, but it's better than me when I had a job. Um, so very easy to make work optional when the income that comes in from sources where you don't have to sell your life one hour at a time is four or five times what it costs you to live. Um, yeah. Angel Carlos. Howdy. How's it going from Oceanside, California? Nice. I was only in Oceanside for Marine Corps training. So all I remember is the bars. Uh, missionary. <laughs> Howdy. More travel sounds good live in Arizona, but if you ever down south in Argentina, got a place for you to stay. Nice. I have not been to Argentina. I guess the first question would be, how do they feel about Americans? That's kind of like one of the top things. One, I like I like to go places where the dollar's strong. 
because it, it helps being frugal and being able to, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just super cheap. And I, I like that when you tip somebody like 10 bucks, it's a massive amount to them. And I like to do that. If you go to somewhere like Europe and you tip 10 bucks, they might laugh you out of the place or not let you back in. Um, so how strong is the dollar there? And do they like Americans? Those are the questions I usually like to ask before I travel somewhere. Julie, I'm thinking investing in a couple properties in Florida or Tennessee would be wise diversification. I don't really trust Washington. I don't trust Washington either. Um, some of the Seattleite rules might spread to the rest of King County, which could then spread to the state, which uh, just harms investors and renters. What they're doing in Seattle is forcing landlords to do a 10% rent increase every year, no matter what. Good tenant, bad tenant, doesn't matter. 10% has to be, they're going to have to, or you'll quickly fall behind on rents. And if you go more than 10%, because you can't ever catch up, you might have to pay your tenants three months rent for them to move if they don't like the 10% increase that you're giving them. That could spread to the whole state. So yeah, it might not hurt to look at other states. Um, yeah, I'm with you. Loco Eddie of Phi. Howdy. Late joining. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Chester Williams. People only distinguish other parts of Virginia, like Tidewater, Richmond from Northern Virginia. I'm so glad I don't have to commute to Tyson's Corner every day. About an hour drive. Yeah, I don't like that. I had to commute for a long time. Did not like it. Couldn't believe how much life changed as soon as you lose a commute that you've had for a while. Hang on a second. Okay. Um, late joining, but okay, where was my spot? There you go. Dawn May, dating asset. If she's a keeper, she'll pay her own way. I said what I said. <laughs> um, you don't find people like that when you look like this. Uh, Jay Hayes, have you ever locked and in, at invest looked at investing in a marina? Slip fees can be eye-catching. Cheers. I have not. Um, I'm a simple creature. I know what works. Um, I know that would probably work if I took the time to learn it. But for me, it is save the money, put the down payment on the next small multifamily, watch the cash flow grow, save the money, <laughs> rinse, repeat. Um, remember the, if you chase five rabbits, you're probably going to starve. This is my rabbit. Charlie, howdy. I asked earlier on your Facebook page if you would adopt me. I saw that. I didn't know it was your name, though. Have you had time to ponder this? Oh, of course. I am potty trained, if that helps, in the decision-making process. But seriously, well done. Thank you. <laughs> um, Brian, howdy. When you, when you change out the locks on a unit with a schlag-coated deadbolt, what do you replace the keypad doorknob with? Or do you leave it? I replace it usually because they're they're older uglier brass gold or whatever so i get the satin chrome i think is what it's called so they're the same I, and i just get a door knob that doesn't have a lock so you have bathroom locks which will have a lock and you have bedroom locks which sometimes will have a lock with a little you can turn it with a coin i don't like to do those either because with some tenants you just end up with holes punched in doors because they have teenagers kids are demons so doors that don't lock goes on the bottom handle. The top, the schlag deadbolt covers the lock. That's the only part that locks. The bottom part, you can just turn, don't need a key. I wouldn't want a tenant locking me out. The goal is I can give a code to a handyman. They can go to the property and get in and out um, without ever having the bottom lock locked. Um, I think I bought some at Lowe's for like $19 because I just, I just bought hardware. This the walkthrough that I did, I probably should have done. I missed that when I was doing the walkthrough to look at the door handles. Say so this is where the coded lock will be. This is where the handles will go. The exterior handles, two bedroom door handles, and then the bathroom had a nice satin nickel already. So that one already matched, but the rest I'm replacing. Um, make them all the same. To me, that, that matters on my property. It's not that they're super high end or super low end. It's that they're all universally the same. Uh, That's a good question. Thank you. Chester, I love that face. It's just water. It's extra. It's just water. Look, can you see? I don't think you can see. It's white. It's clear. Like, oh, I can tilt the camera. It's just water. Extra strength water. It's 
because Clinton, it's because Matt bullies his bosses and his friends too. Ethan, two million, yeah. Um, so it's called Golden Handcuffs. I started working at this company as a part-time night instructor, making $17 an hour. I had a couple of ideas that grew the company. One was founding this nonprofit that does job placement assistance in non-driving positions. So we help people find jobs in HR, IT, operations, forklift, dispatch, and like all these non-driving positions for free. We don't charge a penny. So if you're looking for work, hiddenjobs.org. Um, connect with us. We work with companies that are all over the country. We work with some con co companies that are in other countries. So we can actually help with job placement all over the world. And this helped us develop relationships with local companies. So most truck driving schools train people to go over the road for Swift, Sierra England, to be gone all the time, not make a lot of money. Our graduates get to go to work for companies like Old Dominion, McLean, Oak Harbor, where they make six figures in their home every night with their family. Blew the school up. We went from six staff to 60. Like I grew the school with an idea like that. But they wanted to keep me around. So my pay slowly increased over the years. So I am not, I wasn't, as of today when I quit, I wasn't making $17 an hour anymore, right? I was making good money. But I also owned, technically, while I worked there, 10% of the company. The company's last evaluation was about $20 million. So if they were ever going to sell, I would get 10% of the sale, $2 million, minus taxes. <clears throat> if I worked there, I quit today. I basically said, hey, look, I love you guys. I love working here. It's a great job. There's nothing wrong. I'm just financially free. And in the next decade, I'm going to travel and goof off. And uh, I've, you know, talked about who I've trained to replace me, all the things that I've done, how they can run it, the, the great management team that we have in place, the staff that we have going. I resolved an issue that the company had for the last month that was a big thing hanging over us. I literally knocked it out of the park to clear it up. So we're good. I'm out of here. But doing that, I'm walking away from $2 million. If they sell tomorrow, I don't get a penny. I'm okay with that. I don't need the $2 million. It's just money. When we're investing to get to the income snowball and we haven't reached financial freedom, any amount of money sounds like a money, an amount worth staying for. Once your income coming in is multiples of your living, and all the money that you get that comes in that's beyond your living is generally just saved for the next investment. All $2 million would do would give me more money to invest. I don't need it. What I do need is an extra decade while I'm healthy enough to enjoy it of not working, of being absolutely financially free. Um, but I am leaving in such a way to do everything I can in my power to support them, to, to be available. If, I've told them these are the things that could change that would bring me back. If this person that's replacing me quits, I'm right back to find and train the next one. If, you know, whatever, I'm consulting for free, whatever you need, because they, they've they helped me get to the point that I'm at. I want to help them too. So I don't want to leave them in any kind of bad situation. Um, yeah. So walking away from $2 million. That's a good name for this video. Look for that video coming out soon. Jason, howdy. That's quality, high quality H2O. I had some in my mouth. I could actually say it the way he did. Larry, you gave up the golden handcuffs, but it's more valuable to escape the ball and chain. It is even when it's a job you like. That's that's the part that kind of blows me away. I get if you have a job that you hate, you, the, the, the commute sucks, the coworkers suck, the client sucks, the type of work sucks. Is it too physical? Is it too not physical? Too sedentary? Whatever, everything that you hate about it. Get to financial freedom and get out of there. I reached financial independence in 2018. Like I still had to look at um, price tags, so I wasn't financially free. I, I feel like I'm financially free now. I'm not going to go buy three Lamborghinis, but I can go buy one and not have to worry about it. Um, for four years, I worked when I didn't have to uh, at a job I liked. So it was a weird feeling today going, I like working here and I'm out of here. Matthew Paris, biggest thing with VA over FHA is WDO and wood rot must be fixed. Doors and windows just have to open. Cool. I actually don't think I knew that. I have not used either VA or FHA. I have my VA alone available. I might use it to buy a fourplex in a year or two. Um, so if, if you're working in W-2 and you think, well, Dion quit and he's going to keep investing, it doesn't work that way. I've been investing for 10 years and my, my profit with, you know, 
with depreciation taken out so that it looks like I'm making six figures off my rentals, I will be able to buy another rental because I have several years of tax returns that show that that's been my income. When you first start out, your W-2 is very important for getting that next loan, right? Once you have two, four, six years of rental income of multiple, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, if not six figures, then it might be okay to leave your job and still be able to qualify for the next mortgage. But I wouldn't start with that. Hypno. Howdy. Akash, howdy. Had a question for you. My wife and I will complete medical residency in two years. Our combined income will be around five to five twenty thousand before tax. Best approach to investing into real estate. <clears throat> so you're going to have probably student loans to repay. Um, avoid lifestyle creep. The, the, the lifestyle that you're living as a student while you're getting through this residency, if you can maintain that for a few years, to take that amount of money you're making, keep your expenses low. That if you're able to save, if you can save one or two hundred thousand dollars a year, you don't need to house hack. I suggest house hacking for the people who are making a hundred thousand dollars a year, and we can save twenty or thirty thousand dollars a year. Or if you're making fifty, and you can save ten, house hacking is really important for that. But if you can save the twenty percent or twenty five percent down for investment properties. You might not need to house hack. It would it would speed things up. It works for everybody. Um, I personally, there's a lot of ways to invest. I would still go with buy and hold, 30-year fixed rate debt. I, I wouldn't pay all cash in the beginning. I would want to be doing down payments with leverage on properties that cash flow and then add time to it. You might only get two or three rentals your first one or two years. Once you have two years, you, your debt to income ratio might not be too off depending on what your student loans look like. But if your debt to income ratio is a problem because of high student loans and what your income is for the two of you, if you can get one or two rentals and get rental income on your tax returns, after two years, debt to income ratio means almost nothing. That's whether you're making 50000 a year or 500000 a year. Once you have tax returns with rental income, you can start buying rental properties and the income, 75% of the rents from the property you're buying can be config configured. That's a word. Words are hard can be calculated in your debt to income ratio. So it becomes almost irrelevant as long as you're buying cash flowing properties. Rinse and repeat. You might need more rentals than me. I'm comfortable at 5,000 a month in cash flow. So at 14, I'm comfortable quitting my job and walking away from golden handcuffs. I think the 14 will even be going up. I, I am probably going to be adding another property in the next few months. I don't know. At my stage, I don't know if I'm going to buy all cash or buy with leverage. I haven't decided. I'm going to house hack one more time with VA loan. So I've got all these different options. Then you guys, if you've been to my channel before, you've heard me say this. It's a quote from my daughter. She said this when she was like 16. I was talking about, do I pay off the house? Do I sell the house? Do I redeploy the cash? Do I cash out refinance? She said, and this is a 16-year-old, so you figure... What do they have figured out about life then? But she says, it's hardest to make a decision when both outcomes are positive. So if you're making that and you have your life creep under control and you don't get the big fancy house and the boat and the weekend house and the, all the things that come with people who think that's what makes you look rich, you can actually be wealthy by not trying to look wealthy. That would be my suggestion there. And then my chat moved, sorry. Keith, would you, should you, could you flip one house a year? Me? No. My wife and I do now that all my rentals are paid for. Nice, it keeps you young. Okay. Um, <laughs> almost an overshot. There are many ways to keep yourself young. But flipping is a job. If you like it, go for it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. I wouldn't. I would never want to sell a property. I, I know too many investors who, who talk about, I sold this one, and if I had it now, this is what it'd be worth, or this is what the cash flow would be. There are some times where people say, I sold it, I 1031 into this, this is what it's doing now, so maybe sell for buying something else. But flipping for the income, don't need the income. Um, I don't know. So you said, would you, could you, to, to me, no, because I'm not looking for a job. If I get bored in five years, I might flip a property. And it'll probably be just because I have enough money to do that with. Um, not my goal, though. It sounds like you guys are enjoying it, though. So that's awesome. Clinton, 
Did the truck driving school at least offer a pizza party to get you to stay? <laughs> I think I've thrown more pizza parties there than anybody. Um, and I think they had enough respect to not even ask me to stay because both of them know that if they heartfeltly looked at me and said, we really need you. Can you please stay? I probably would. So I'm glad they didn't ask. That was very respectful of them. Akash. And paying down our loans total 400000 We have one duplex I bought with your brother. Cool. Yeah, so paying down the loans. Yeah, 400000 doesn't seem... Oh, 500000 in income. 400000 Yeah, I, I think I would... Find out what the interest rates are. There's a way I look at debt where if it's 6% or greater interest rate, I focus on paying it off. If it's 6% or less, I focus on buying cash flowing assets until the income snowball kicks in to then get rid of the debt. Um, yeah. So you might, depending on your interest rate, look at both uh, paths. Clinton, have you ever thought about recasting any of your loans with the excess money? I have thought about it. I did refinance in 2020 when rates drop. So if rates drop again, I do have one loan that's at like a 4.8. I might refinance it if rates drop low enough again. I haven't thought about recasting as much. So let's see if I can articulate this because I haven't thought this out loud yet. I have $400,000 or so. I have a mortgage at 4.8% interest where I owe $230,000. I could pay that off. I could pay off the $230,000 and then that duplex will cash flow. The principal and interest payment will then start coming to me. I'll still be paying property and, and insurance, right? But the principal and interest payment gets added to the cash flow on that property. Or I could take the $400,000 and buy another property with $230,000 down. or buy one 300, 350,000 in all cash because the loan that's on this existing property, I had appraisal, paid points to buy down the loan, uh, loan origination costs, whatever else was in there. I paid that to make it happen. So I'd have to do like a full cost benefit analysis of which one would have the better return, which is a better use of the money. Both outcomes would be good. More cash flow with one less mortgage to worry about uh, or an extra property to manage that adds to the cash flow. Um, I have, uh, but so on top of that is also recasting, taking fifty thousand dollars, putting it on a mortgage, recasting it so that my payment comes down. Um, haven't done it, but I have thought about it, which was the phrasing of your question. Laura, howdy. Traveling meetup meeting at the cities you were vacationing scuba at. I will probably do that. Um, I don't know that I would travel somewhere to go to a meetup, but I tried when I went to Florida. I said, like, like, like for two months, I talked, hey, I'm going to Florida. I'm going to scuba dive. I'm going to be there until I get bored and go home. I met up with people, had lunch, um, had a lot of Bloody Marys. Uh, thanks for that, Daryl. Um, they were lobster Bloody Marys. Those were great. But there were no meetups to go to. So I might, when I'm traveling, kind of announce, hey, are there any meetups in this area? I'd like to come and, and see what happens. But I don't know that I would ever go. I heard there's a meetup. I'm going to go there. Um, we'll see. Welcome home. Took a message back to make me lose sleep tonight. And always wonder forever and ever what that message said. Frank, howdy. If you owned two single family homes as rentals, would you recommend sticking with single family homes or multifamily units to continue building a portfolio? I own one single family home and I continued with small multifamily because they are what cash flowed in my area. Michael Zuber finds single family homes that cash flow in his area. So it depends on your local market. Can you find single family homes that get you a yield or small multifamily homes. The reason I talk about those two is because they come with 30 year fixed rate debt. So that's the reason I'm not talking about 30 year unit apartment complexes. There is a loan product through Convoy Home Mortgage where they'll go up to eight units with 30 year fixed rate debt, but it's a DSCR loan. So if you don't have 10 loans in your name, you're not gonna get as good an interest rate as you can with one to four units. So Michael Zuber says this often, 
It doesn't matter if you want single family, small multifamily or apartment complex. He looks at the yield. What would the cash on cash return be? Which one has the best? That's the one you pursue. For five units or more, I think the turnover is going to be higher than I'm getting with four units or less. With my properties, they have their own garage, their own fenced yards, their own parking areas. They have more of a sense of it being a home than a unit. So I have very little. I'm coming up on 12 years of investing now. And if you take out the first year where my tenant was a nightmare, I've had, I'm having my fourth ever tenant turnover with small multifamily. One of my turnovers was in my single family. So my turnover is very small, very low with small multifamily. Um, yeah, so I would look at yield and then choose the one that made the most sense depending on what I can find in the local market. Uh, Angel R, do you prefer to carry appendix or strong side? I carry strong side pocket. Um, pocket holster um, and go off the law enforcement um, aspect of it's going to be three rounds at three feet in three seconds. That's going to be your average if you get pulled into something like that. So strong side, left-handed front pocket. Um, but I prefer uh, either hammerless revolver or I have a Sig Sauer anti-snag where it doesn't have anything that can catch on your pocket so you can pull it out quick. Um, Carlos, howdy. Sorry, currently working, delivering propane tanks. Nice. I'm just tuning in. I got out of the core after nine years. Nice. I only made six. I have no money, 10000 in debt, and live in Oceanside, California. Rent is expensive. $2,279. Um, learn how to save. So keep saving, Carlos. Keep adding. Um, figuring out the debt, if it has 6% or higher interest, I would focus on paying it off. Less than that, I would pay the minimums, but I would learn how to invest. I would really look at house hacking, save the down payment for an owner-occupied property. You might have to draw like a concentric circle around the city and go out until you find the price point that makes sense for what you can do and what you can afford to qualify for with your income. Um, if you're delivering propane, you should move to Washington. I'll hire you as an instructor at our campus before I quit. Uh, and properties up here are probably, the weather does not like Oceanside, California, though. <laughs> and the beaches aren't like that either. Um, or the people at the beaches. But um, you have your VA loan available. So that could be if you did nine years, depending on your type of discharge. That could be a zero down, get into a triplex or a fourplex. You can actually be getting paid to live where you are instead of paying $2,279. Then you can be saving $2,000 a month towards your next investment. You have a lot of options. I'm going to put my email in the chat, which is, this is available for everybody. But you can always reach out with questions and I'll see if I can help you um, get on the property ladder. I don't charge, just trying to help. What should I do to be where you are just to start? Listen to everything I said in the last 39 seconds. Joshua, howdy. Love the content as always, thank you. Looking to house hack a single family house, but can't seem to get a deal on the MLS that hits the great deal yield. House is sitting longer, but still going close to asking. Watch days on market. Um, if you're looking to house hack a single family, I would look for a single family with ADU or maybe branch out to a duplex. You, you talk to different lenders until you can find another one that will do a 5% down conventional so you can get in there too. You can use FHA with duplex too. But in a lot of places, single family houses just don't cash flow. Um, there are geniuses like Todd Baldwin in Seattle who gets it to work by renting by the room. So it's possible. But in my area with my investing strategy, I have never seen a single family house that would cash flow, no matter how it was purchased in the last 10 years. I purchased a single family house in the dinosaur days before I was an investor and had it for a decade before I even tried to rent it out. Um, so it cash flows because of the rents going up on a mortgage that was from 20 years ago. But I have not seen a single family house that I could buy as an investment in 12 years of investing. Um, so I have ideas on that. Um, expand your search and look at a little bit different asset classes. House with ADU might cash flow easier. Jay Hayes, Akash, look into government programs. You can get your student loans paid off for working so many hours per year. I believe available in just about any city. Good luck. Okay, cool. 
I know that student loans are a ripoff and most people get told that if you work in government or in, in, in certain education stuff that you can get your student loans forgiven and 98% of the time they were denied. So uh, I think they're getting better at that now, but that's the data that I found when we were we did a video. The Three Amigos did a video on the student loan crisis and I gave my opinion. Well, actually I gave the, the devil's advocate opinion of should those loans be forgiven or should they not? Um, and they tried to be as, as politically neutral as possible because YouTube can demonetize your channel and stop sharing your channel with other people if they figure out that you're on one side or the other. So it's a hard topic to even talk about. Uh, Jason, howdy. Can you share what area you are in, Joshua? Missionary. And AR, love Americans, Argentina, love Americans, and tourism, recommend Mendoza to visit and travel. Patagonia. Okay. I will have to check that out. Appreciate all the value you give. We for sure get a course, book, and appreciate all the videos. I'm looking forward to it. I will I'll definitely be doing a book. I have it outlined. I have I have most of the, the content idea down. Uh, I want to get that written because I know this from teaching for the last 10 plus years at the CDL school that people learn in different ways. Some people it's audio, some people you need visual, you need, you know, some of us need clipped in little charts that show us things through our, make our brain retain it. And some people need to read. So I want to get that in there. The course, I'm probably going to make a course and then have some friends like Matt, the lumberjack landlord, or a couple people from here just sample, have you like take the course and give me your feedback. And, and if you think it sucks, then I'll tear it down. And if you think it's totally worth it, then I might put it out. We'll see. Um, I'm just not sure about the course thing because I'm so gun shy with courses of the give me $13,000 and in 48 hours, I'll teach you how to invest people that are out there that are really good at selling stuff because it's a, the people sign up for it. Like I don't want to in any way, even my, mentally with myself, be associated with that kind of crap. Um, but one or $200 because Teachable charges their fee and it costs about 5,000 to set up just the platform. Sure, if I can get to break even, it's worth putting it together if that's the way people learn. Um, yeah. Thank you. Rob, thank you. Congrats. I think you smoked Matt to the finish line. Poor, poor. But, but Matt is my much, much younger, much younger brother from another one. Now you can add insult to injury and buy a Vegas house before. Oh, that is a great idea. I actually have the cash to buy a Vegas house now. I wonder if I should just go do that. I think if I got to the bottom of my water faster, I'd probably just go buy a Vegas house. Matt doesn't drink. And I don't know that he gambled. He might gamble. I'm trying to figure out why he wants a Vegas house, other than the temperature. I don't know. Um, Akash, thank you. Thank you. Josh, howdy. Congrats. Thank you. Laura, I mean, you're organized. Oh, mean you organizing the meeting? Maybe. The problem is if you're out of area and you want to organize a meeting somewhere. So when we do the Tacoma Fi meetups here, we've got a couple of restaurants. We know that they're totally fine with us just dropping in with 15 to 20 people. If I was going to do it at a distance, I'd have to travel there. So I'd be going there for scuba probably, but then I'd have to retain a place which can cost a couple thousand dollars, which means since I'm trying to help people, I'd feel stupid if I was spending money to do it. So I would say, hey, if you want to come, it's going to be this much money. And then I feel like I'm making money to even get to break even. Uh, so I'm trying to avoid that. But if people had meetups there, I'd probably stop in. We'll see. Tom Kine, explain recast, please. It's when you take a significant amount of money. And for most lenders, it's usually a minimum of like $20,000. And you make a one-time payment on your mortgage. And it brings down the amount that you owe, a significant amount, enough to where the lender then does the math and says, so it's not changing. If you have 17 years left on your mortgage and you recast, take $20,000 off. They go, it's still 17 years, but based on this new amount, here's the interest and principal payments for those 17 years. Reducing your payment, because your payments from start to finish on your loan are based on the total amount you borrowed at the beginning, and then it's amortized where, where principal and interest crisscross uh, and, and, you know, across the, the 30 years of the loan. Well, when you recast, you're starting it again with a lower amount. 
And there's even more math to it from that because I think they recast it based on where your principal and interest is in that um, amortization scale now. Um, I haven't done it. I have The question was, have I thought about it? I have thought about it. Haven't done it though. And um, before I would like listen to anything I just said, let me do research on what recasting is and I'll make a short video on that to, to make sure I have all the details right. Or I might have somebody like Matt, the mortgage guy, come on here and explain it because he's got a brain. Millennial Mike, howdy. Thanks for stopping in. Everybody on the team carries appendix, but I do strong side holster. Okay. I don't break firearm safety rules, which appendix carry points that gun at something I don't want it pointed at. Fair enough. Nice. Rob, Carlos, go to Vista and get a duplex. There you go. One year, Mike. Congrats on that retirement. You absolutely legend. You absolutely legend. I'm sure the lumberjack is crying in the chat somewhere. <laughs> uh, we'll see how many times he can get that picture sent to him of the way to avoid stress at work is to not go to work before he blocks me or quits. <laughs> Joshua, or do you think it's okay to take a little less than great yield just to get in the in a property? A lot of times, house hacks don't have a yield while you're house hacking. Uh, I don't know the numbers exactly, but I know Millennial Mike is living in a duplex where I think he lives for free. So that's no yield if you look at the cash flow of it, right? But when he moves out, it will cash flow. When I lived in my duplex, I was also paying $300 a month. So there's no yield. But once I moved out, then the yield was above 12% when I moved out. So sometimes the house hack is to get into the property for the low money down and the best interest rate. And then the cash flow happens. There, there's a, a video on my channel. I did a short live while I was in Florida called uh, how to run the numbers on a house hack, how to calculate the yield on a house hack. Um, and it breaks down exactly how I would do that to figure out if a house hack is worth pursuing, even if it's not going to make money while you live there. Brian Rogers. Howdy. You're a good man too. Charlie Brown, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Julio, howdy. What's the minimum population of a market to use your investing strategy? And one of the places that I invest, I almost called it a city, but if Daniel Pitchler is still on, is on here, he lives in a town that <laughs> I don't think they have a population sign. And you can drive through the city in 25 seconds um, at the legal speed limit. I invest there. I own a duplex there because population is one of the criteria for the diversification strategy for the properties. I wanna be close, I wanna be more than 10 miles away from my other property, so I'm pulling tenants from different sources, but I wanna be close to several different economic drivers, a base, a port, a college, a hospital, Boeing or Amazon, or a large population. A large population is no different than a Boeing or Amazon terminal to me, it's one of those criteria. So this little tiny town of McKenna, Washington, uh, it's, it's, it's like an, it's not even a dot on the map. They don't have a municipality. They don't have a city hall. They don't have anything like that. They don't have a post office, which I think is the criteria to be a city. I think it's a post office. But they don't have one. But Joint Base Lewis McCord is one of the largest military installations on the West Coast. Wilcox Farms is a large dairy there. Boeing is not too far away. The capital of Olympia is not too far. It's kind of centrally located. This little tiny thing. So Joint Base Lewis McCord is shaped... Um, you know, is central to this area. On this side, we have Tacoma and Lakewood, which is um, not metropolitan, but it's city, like it's it's congested, right? McKenna is forest and woods. So a lot of the people who get stationed on a military base are from rural areas, parts of Texas, parts of Montana, places where they're really far. They get stationed on JBLM. The last thing they want to do is live in Tacompton or Lakewood, right? They want to go to Little McKenna, have the back gate to get on the gate, the base. They're just as far away as somebody living in one of the cities, but I've got economic drivers close to that property. So to consider it a large population so that it can replace base, port, Boeing, you know, one of the other criteria, I would look at 100,000 population. If the population is less than that, then I just want other things like those companies, a hospital, a college, or, or other economic drivers in the area. So it's, it's one of those factors. That was a good question. 
Clinton, where did you store your cash for saving for your first rental? In the bank. <laughs> In a low interest savings account. It's there now. I am not looking for yield on money sitting in a saving account. I want that to kind of scratch the back of my mind saying you're losing money every day to inflation. You need to find the next cash flowing asset. Be looking every day as you're saving more and accruing more in this saving. What options open up? It, it, in the beginning, it's low down payment for an owner occupied house hack. As that grows, it's an investment property. As it grows, it's possibly a burr funded by your own money. As it grows, it's possibly buying a house, a house all cash and then refinancing out later when rates look better. Like your options just become exponentially more as that grows in a low interest savings account with the bank that motivates me to find the next deal. So probably not the best answer to go with, but it's the one that's helped me get to where I'm at. Hope that helped. Valhalla, howdy. Welcome to retirement. Thank you. I was able to get there at 35. Awesome. About six years ago, one of the best events of my life. Would love to add any perspective and value to your channel and discuss you would like. That is really cool. I put my email in the chat a minute ago. If you can email me, that would be great. I might have some questions for you. Um, I went to a barbecue at my brother's not uh, last week, maybe the week before. It was, it was right before the cruise. And I asked him, I asked him a couple questions. And he's been retired for eight years on paid off rental properties. And I don't, I don't know if, he, if he's if he's ever on my channel, I'll let him share his, his numbers if he's comfortable with it. But I know he has enough cash flow to be financially free. I asked him, you've been retired for eight years now. In those eight years, has there been a time where you feel like you can't buy something or you can't afford something or can't do something because your income is coming from assets, not from you're not generating it by working for it? And he said no. And that was my one kind of concern I was looking at is, so right now, in four years, I have not touched a penny of the income that comes from my job. All of that money from my W-2 for four years has gone into an account, just adding to the investing for the, you know, next saving for the next investment. So I know I was not dependent on the job for four years. But it's a safety net to where if the cash flow from rentals didn't cover my expenses this month, I also had W-2 income, which is now not going to be that. Uh, so my questions might be something along the lines of that. And congratulations on making it. That's cool. Lewis, howdy. I am stuck. I have six income properties with one paid off. I don't know how to pay off these properties. Why would you ever pay them off? I don't want mine to ever pay. I want thousand year mortgages. Um, that came out snarky. I was trying to be a little sarcastic. I think I failed. So I didn't mean to, to like snap back at you. Um, why would you pay them off? Are your interest rates above 6%? The one I paid off was at 6%. So it made sense for me to do it. And if I refinanced at that time, interest rates were above 6%. So I focused and paid it off. If your interest rates are below 5%, you just save the money that you would use to pay that off and buy the next property with it. Um, yeah, I don't I don't actually, like I've talked kind of jokingly about, oh, if I sold my house, I take the money and pay off a mortgage or two. One less place to deal with, more cash flow. But that's the an unintelligent use of my money. If I sold the property in 1031 into another property, I would increase the cash flow more. So I don't know that you're stuck. Add a little bit of time to your equation. Keep saving as you save. Your, your options change on that list of things I just went through. Um, I don't know. It, it, some people just have this like in the email that I got from Tom and a couple of other people of, you know, don't retire. You have debt. Like I have $1.8 million in debt. I wish I had $10 million in debt because I'd be retiring with all of Matt's. I'd, I would buy every Lamborghini that Matt found that he liked. It was a good price. I'd buy it. And then I'd send him pictures of it. Um, if I had $10 million in debt, I don't. I have 1.8. So I'm just going to retire comfortably. I wish I had more debt. I don't really plan on paying it off. Tenants are going to pay it off over time and I won't care. Like by the, I'll be 70 or 80 by the time they get to paying any of these off. Um, I won't care. So it's a good question. I would not focus on paying off the debt unless the interest rates were above 6%. Maybe it makes sense to pay off the debt because that's that's a guaranteed return on your money of the principal and interest cash flow that can go to you once it's paid off. 
But if the interest rate is below 6% and you can get something like an 8 to 10% return on a property where that's year one. We always focus on what is your yield? It's year one, right? Year one is usually around 10% for me. It's way over 20 after year three with just regular rent increases. Just, just, and sometimes it's the, you know, you, you find another room or you make another room or something like that happens. But uh, add time to the element and I don't think I would focus on paying off the debt. Lumberjack landlord. Buy a Vegas house. I will buy next to you. Nice. Uh, make recordings even easier. That's true. Yes, Lumberjack gambles. There you go. But if you couldn't tell, it's more about the food. <laughs> that is one thing I do like to do. I should do. I, I want to do a video on like, here's the ways to save money. And, and it's things people would never think about. Like one of them is I only eat out. I would never eat at my house. Eating at my house would cost me three times the amount that it cost me to eat out. And here's why. One of the, th the reasons why is eating at casinos because they're not trying to make money off the food. They're trying to make money off the people who drink and then gamble. Um, I would never block my much older brother. I would write a message and re and redact it daily though. Oh, nice. Like Tom. Beautiful. <laughs> yes. Vegas has really good food. Just casinos have great food. You just got to find the ones where they don't let you smoke inside, which was the great thing about the cruise I was just on with Norwegian. There was a smoking section somewhere. Someone talked about it, but I never got stuck in a confined area with people that smell that way. Rob, yep, Tom Kine pulling back messages because <laughs> he knows. Um, Tom, any concerns about upcoming layoffs affecting unemployment and possibly rent? Sorry, I'm driving and using Google Voice, no worries. No, um, in 12 years, I've never had a late or missing rent payment. Um, unemployment in the state is ridiculous. It pays like between five and $700 a week. So if people get laid off, it's probably going to be easier for them to make their rent payments. Um, and I, I rent in class C areas. I'm not in Seattle, so I don't have really high tech people working there. I keep one third section eight, one third military and one third working or retired. So if everybody working or retired, working lost it, I would, I would have the retired money still coming in. I'd have section eight money still coming in. I'd have military money still coming in. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to teach people to diversify your, your properties by being more than 10 miles apart next to economic drivers, but also your tenant base. And I'm really glad that Matt, the lumberjack landlord is now, you know, for a long time, he wasn't doing any section eight because they had such a bad reputation. But if you think of the diversification where, what if there's a massive stock market crash and a whole bunch of layoffs happen? Section eight pays, military pays. What if there's a prolonged government shutdown and the military doesn't get paid? People working or retired pay. Section 8, even though we had an over 60-day government shutdown one time, they still paid. But it's possible it went on long enough they might not pay. You have the other. So I try not to be over leveraged. I talk about I have $1.8 million in debt, but my property values are over $5 million. So net worth now is a little over $3 million. I can handle a 50% reduction in rents and not have to go into my own money, like not pay my mortgages. And again, I said this earlier. So Tom, I think you were here for this because you're, you're, you're driving, I think, right? Since we started tracking the data in 1914, rents have never once gone down in class B or C areas. In class A in 2009, they dipped, but that's the only time. Rents have always gone up. In a recession, rents go up because there's more demand. Now, when people get laid off, they might take in roommates. I won't say, no, you can't have roommates. They might, um, I'm just gonna say move in with family or something, but that's taking in roommates. So I have, I have no concerns with that because I've planned for it. I am ready for people to not pay rent, whether it's Section 8 stops paying, military stops paying, working retired stops paying. Something can be impacted, but they're diversified different sources of income to where I sleep like a baby. Oliver, howdy. Jason C. Lumberjack Landlord. <laughs> Julie, have you looked into this group, Real Estate Investors Association of Washington? I have not. I tend to stay away from all associations um, as far as being a member. I do present for a lot of associations. Um, one time I joined, I, I was I was like, the, I was on the board for the King County Veterans Advisory Board. I was the president of the Northwest Career Colleges Federation. So I've been in those kind of group settings things. And I joined some in the beginning to figure out what I can learn. And what I usually found out in almost all of those settings is I was in them so people could learn from me. So I have not looked into them because I'm trying to share my information here. Let me know what you think about them though. Brown sugar baby, howdy. 
I can finally say, but yes, I retired today. Mario, thank you, congrats. Rob, Dion, how much unrecycled capital do you think you invested to reach retirement? $320,000 over 12 years. And the last purchase was last year, so over 11 years. That was the total out-of-pocket investing that I did to reach a cash flow of $168,000 a year this year, um, which is going to be actually be more because I found out I have a two-bedroom instead of a one-bedroom I'm going to be renting out. But um, I've invested down payments a little over $600,000, but almost $300,000 of that was recycled cash flow from rentals coming in. The 320 is money I've saved over the last 11 years of investing. Um, and, and even with that, that's not true because I think I shared it earlier. This is Bank of America. There's what? 395,000 in there right now. So that's the next property. That means if I just don't buy anything, I've got all my money back out from recycled cash flow. So nothing. I've never done a refinance. I've never done a HELOC. I've only taken rents and reinvested them. And then for the last four years, every penny coming in from W2 reinvested it. So that's rents paying me back everything. So technically I have negative money invested into real estate to reach financial freedom. I need to actually sit down and do the math on that on a whiteboard sometime. Um, don't sue me, bro. I try to be as transparent as possible and share like the real numbers. Like this is what it's like. It was not like that the first five years. The first five years, it was like, I'm going to go to a restaurant. I'm going to get a bowl of water and a cup of water. And then the kids can get whatever they, whatever they would get. I, I remember the richest I've ever felt was when I went to a restaurant. Not only did I get a meal, but at a restaurant, I had a soda. Like I couldn't imagine paying two or three dollars for a drink at a restaurant because a single parent with three kids. When we went out, that, like that was that was all the money we had. To now, I eat out because it's cheaper <laughs> than if I was to eat at the house. I will explain that in a video too. Um, yeah. So originally, Rob, I would have said three hundred twenty thousand. I've done the math and then a video before, but technically, rents have paid me back. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, Elizabeth, howdy. Congratulations. You're one of the reasons we got the courage to invest up to three, awesome, to three units so far over the last eight months. That's amazing. Working out our eight-year notice at this point. Awesome. Perfect. Julio, howdy. Congratulations. I'm resisting the golden handcuffs. Thank you. Live your best life. I inspire you. Awesome. Andrew, thank you. We are at Two hours and 42 minutes. I still have some water left from our, of course, sponsor of the video, Alien Vodka, who does not sponsor the video, but makes it possible. This is, uh, I'm going to give you guys just a minute to hopefully come up with any more questions you have. We have like another 15 minutes or so I'd like to get through. If there's questions that we can answer, and it can be AMA time, like, like any topic, any subject, this is what an investor knows. Ask away. Did you know commercial drivers have to take drug tests? And I've had a CDL <laughs> for a billion years. And after I am no longer working at this company, I will not be in a random drug pool. And I live in a state where marijuana is legal. Well, I don't smoke. They do make edibles. And I think I'm going to um, have to get with my kids and find out what's good. <laughs> Proud parent moment. Okay. Um, where was I at? Andrew, thank you. Closed on your fourplex, just working on renovations and getting them rented. Awesome. Nice. Let me know how it goes. Um, I have one coming up too that I, I'm meeting with the handyman to go through and figure out what all they're going to do. Um, did a walkthrough video of it last weekend. And it'll be my first one I list on Hemlane. So I have been using apartments.com to list. This will be listing on Hemlane, which has 30 different platforms that they put it out on. So I, uh, I'll be able to make a video and say this is what the demand looked like compared to what my last one last month on apartments.com was compared to 
this month. Um, congratulations, Andrew. That's awesome. Michael. Also, if you want to use Hemlane and you want a discount, give them the code Dion, D-I-O-N, and you get a discount. Michael, hey, howdy, Michael. Congratulations. Thanks. I've temporarily retired to pursue another goal. Nice. And live on my savings, so I've got no worries while I work towards your goal. Love the channel. Awesome. Nice. Rob, where to next? I think back to Thailand. The, you know, like the goal was to do Russia this year, but that's changed. But I think um, I'm going to probably check with my brother and uh, figure out where the next trip is. I'm not sure. It'll be somewhere where there is good scuba because I haven't scuba for a month and a half. That's not good. And the Puget Sound this is not good for scuba. Um, not just because you can only see 10 feet, because 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 when you can't see 10 feet, there's a, an octopus that comes after you. Um, and they're bigger than you here. Um, I know they're not called that here. They're called something else, but... Blech. Michael Smith, what is going on in trucking? Uh, demand is greater than ever. The requirements to get your CDL are more restrictive than ever. Um, federal regulations are impacting employers' ability to do training, so the, the employers aren't able to train their own drivers anymore on, on a large scale. Sc school requirements are getting cracked down on by agencies to try to take away the schools that are bad players, um, you know, not giving enough training or overcharging or doing whatever the problems are. Um, so the driver demand is greater than ever. We've got local employers all over the place offering ten to $15,000 sign-on bonuses. Uh, yeah, trucking is crazy. Seems like the less we go out to go shopping, the more stuff gets delivered, the more driver need there is. Nice. Oliver took back a message to also make me lose sleep. Keith, way to go, Andrew. I agree. Corby, howdy. Have you considered using the 50-40-10 method? I have made an offer of the 50-40-10 on a property, but I don't think they had enough equity was the end result. So I've considered it. Um, with the blended rate, if I could find a seller who had enough equity to use the 50-40-10, I'll make that offer. Currently, I'm making conventional offers. I think I'm going to save a little bit more and probably buy a duplex all cash um, and maybe refinance later. I might buy one with a mortgage. I don't know. I'm watching interest rates. It's, uh, to quote my daughter again, it's hard to make choices when all outcomes are positive. Um, but yes, I've looked at the 50-40-10 as an option. Brock, howdy. Hey, Deanna, congrats. Thank you. I have a quick question regarding cash reserves. So I know that you say you take out around 10% for CapEx repairs, but is there a cap you put on that number if not used? Thank you. I was in, I think it's Icy Point Strait, Alaska. I think that was where I was at. And I got onto a, um, I was standing next to a 5G tower and I got onto a, uh, what's the thing called where you get into a cart and it floats across the sky? Um, I forget what they're called. Gondola. Get in the gondola. And I started a live stream on reserves like a week ago. Um, and it started great. Here's how reserves work. Here's how I started. Here's the way I look at it. It's the fastest moving gondola in Alaska. So within two and a half minutes, I was so far away from the 5G tower that I lost service. <laughs> and the live stream died. So I took that down, um, which sucked. There was like 14 people who logged in on a random middle of the day live stream. So I appreciate when you guys can pop in for that. But uh, here's how reserve looked. And there is a video on my channel called How Much in Reserves that really breaks this down. Uh, so this is a Cliff Notes version. When I had seven units or less, I saved $10,000. So when I'm looking at buying a property, yes, I set aside mentally 5% for vacancy and 10% for repairs and maintenance. So 15% has to be set aside because I self-manage. With that 15 cent aside, what is my yield, right? That's, that's my expenses that I'm also setting aside. So you have principal, interest, taxes, insurance, and 15% of gross rents set aside. If what's left gives me the yield I'm looking for, then I pursue it. So the asset can stand on its own. I saved up to $10,000 when I had seven units or less, anything above $10,000 doesn't get added 
to my life expenses, that extra 15% that I would be using to fill that $10,000 with, then goes into the investing fund, speeding up the time to the next investment, but not something that I need to live my current lifestyle on. So the next investment happens faster. If I ever dipped into reserves and it went below 10, then the 15% of gross rents would be used to refill that until it got to 10. The 10,000 is basically Murphy's Law. If, if something can go wrong, it's probably going to. So a roof is going to fail. A hot water heater is going to break. I'm going to have foundation issues. Somebody's not going to pay a month or two of rent. I haven't had any of those happen, but they could, right? So here's the $10,000 that can handle that one or two issues when they come up. But Murphy's fourth corollary is if any sequence of events can go wrong, they probably will. And in the worst possible order. Once I had more than seven units, I'm up to 16 now. I increase the 10,000 to 30. So that 30 will cover... Um, I have to actually make a mental shift in the middle of the speech. More things happening. Two roofs, two or three tenants not paying, a couple foundations, two or three water heaters, whatever can happen cumulatively, that 30000 can cover that. So anything above 30000 which there is more than that, goes into the investing fund. If someday I stop working, you know, like today, I'm going to increase that to 50000 So my reserve as of today going forward is $50,000. But I still buy my properties as though I'm looking at 15% were being set aside. What is my cash on cash return? I think Matt doesn't do that, the lumberjack landlord. And I think it just dawned on me why his yield is 20% or greater. Because if I take out the 15% that I'm setting aside for cash, cash repairs and vacancy, and I, I factor that as cash flow, I'll have to do the math on mine. I'm pretty sure my return would be 20 to 30% or more because that's coming out of gross rents. And if you've ever seen my channel before, when I talked about the hidden cost of property management, a 10% a property management fee ends up being a 30% fee on your profits. So let me know. Oh, we have enough time to explain. If you want me to explain that, I can. But um, yeah, so I think that might be one of the reasons why Matt, the Lumberjack Landlord, has such good returns because I don't think once he has his reserves built, I think he's looking at everything above principal interest taxes and insurance is yield, part of the yield calculation. I'll have to ask him that. Um, although it's like 9.52 in his world, so he's probably sleeping. Um, um, here we go. Okay, there we go. Matthew Paris, congratulations. Thank you. Michael Smith, howdy. Question, is there a government program that will pay for trucking school? If so, what is it? Um, first one, join the military. Your GI Bill will cover it. Second one is if you're not high income, so you have to be low income for your area or on unemployment or collecting some type of state benefits like food stamps, state medical or something, you can qualify for WIOA the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. It's federal funds designed to make you, to train you to be more employable. But if you are making more than probably $15 an hour, and you know, if you're single or maybe more than $20 an hour, but if you have two or three kids, they're gonna expect you to pay for it yourself. There are a lot of employers who will reimburse you. You can go to work for companies like McLean. Sometimes they'll pay you while you're in the training. There are a lot of ways to get a CDL where it doesn't have an out-of-pocket cost because of the driver shortage. Um, but if you're looking for a government program, you go to your local work source or workforce or whatever it's called in your state, American Job Center is what they're called federally, and they'll have access to what is called a WIOA, WIOA, Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act funds. Um, if you're in a place like Idaho, they'll pay up to $7,500 for this program called Idaho Launch. So if you live in Idaho and you intend to work in Idaho, it doesn't matter what you make. They have $7,500 sitting there, and our school is way less than that, to pay for our school for you to come through our program. So there are several different programs, depending on your location. There might be a different one in your state, but I currently only work in Washington state and Idaho as far as CDL training goes, currently as of seven hours ago. Um, cool, Rob, funny thing. I have a feeling you're going to work harder in retirement than you did in your job, probably, probably. Issa, howdy. Okinawa has some of the best beaches for scuba. That's where I actually learned. I was my, one of my first overseas duty stations in the Marines, got scuba qualified there by some guy named Kirby. That's all I remember is because I still have the I still have the original when I was 19 years old scuba cert. Um, I did what? Um, open water, advanced open water search and rescue. I didn't do the, the, the ones after that though. 
Michael Smith, question. I missed the start, but are you thinking of more perpetual tourist approach or staying in one spot overseas for a while? Um, take more of the alien truth serum. <laughs> I took all of it. This is, yeah, that's enough for one night of water because, you know, I don't want to overhydrate. It's bad for you. It can give you a headache the next day. Um, I'm probably not going to travel country to country as much as if I go to Thailand, it's going to be stay on an island for a month, maybe make sure I'm on Koh Phanang for the three day um, full moon festival, but then I go to Chiang Mai for a month, you know, kind of depending on the time of year, well, wh whether it's rainy or whatever, wherever I'm going to want to be, but in that one country, um, two to three months and then try a different country and then come back to the U.S. And, um, different parts of the U.S. I have some family in California. I hate California. I don't know if I might go visit them. Um, I want to go into Vegas whenever Matt's in Vegas. So it'll depend on that too. So, yep. Brad, howdy, just joined. But sure you may have answered this, but how are you able to get all of your money back with no refis and light renovations? My rental is only cash flowing 400. Not sure what you're missing. So your money is still in there. It's still your money. It's just sitting in the property, not in the bank. So if you wanted your money, you, you sell, you get your money back. You cash out refinance, you get your money back. You take a home, a home equity line of credit, you get your money back. That was the thing that stopped me from investing for a decade. Is my brother saying, unless you're talking, we might be talking two different things, but how am I getting all my money back? So my rentals, the first year, most units cash flowed about $400, $500. So you're probably right in there. But rents go up. Mortgages sometimes refinance to lower interest rates. Sometimes you find things like I I'll find an extra bedroom or I'll make an extra bedroom. With 16 rental units, my cash flow right now is a little over 14,000 a month. So it's 800 to a thousand dollars a unit, right? That's not year one. And some of them, it might not be year two or three, but year three, four or five, they start to just cash flow because rents keep going up, especially with the record rent increases. We saw like 40% increase two years in a row here in 2020 and 2021 here in Washington. Uh, so rents are just stupid. I don't know why, but I keep mine below area average and I'm still making out. Um, and I've been investing for 12 years. So I, I've invested over 320,000 of my own money. I've invested a little less than 300,000 of my rents into this, you know, like recycled rents. Um, and right now there's almost $400,000 sitting in my bank account, which meant if I don't ever buy another thing, I've gotten all my money back from my rents. But the other way I was looking at it was my brother always said, if he buys a rental in 11 years, he gets his money back. So I thought I would never buy a rental. That's stupid. He had his money. So he bought a rental. So 11 years, he can get it back. That's when I realized what I started talking about was when he purchases a rental, he's not spending any money. You didn't spend, you spent some money on an appraisal and an inspection and closing costs and stuff like that. But the down payment you didn't spend, you moved it from the bank into the property. And unless property values drop a whole bunch, and then you have to sell, that's not a loss. You'd have to sell if it dropped. And right now in my state, if we saw a 30% crash, let's say tomorrow prices 30% down, that's a 10% increase. The biggest housing crash in a one year period in my lifetime was in 2008 to 2009. In one year, property values went down 8.9%. That's how impossible it would be in a year for property prices to drop 30%. But here's what would happen if they did. Property values in Washington state. So this is different in, in some areas. The average across the nation was 21%. There were some that hit 30, like San Francisco and Seattle. They were above 30% appreciation two years in a row. So in two years, 60% appreciation. Here in my, in my area that I invest, the two counties that I'm in, Pierce and Thurston County, Washington, it was 24%. So 2020, property values increased 24%. In 2021, property values went up 24%. So it's 44% increase in two years. If property values dropped tomorrow 30% in one day, we're still 14% above where we were in 2020. That's not even a crash. It's not a correction. That's prices went up too fast, too high. So prices would have to drop and you'd have to sell soon for you to lose money. That's how you get your money back. And you only have one rental. It's what I'm looking at, right? There it is, light renovations. My rental, so it's singular, is only cash flowing $400. So you, you, you 
In two or three years, what do you think will happen to rents? Your mortgage, your taxes and insurance might go up a little, but your mortgage will stay the same. Uh, you might add another rental and, and cash flow from that can grow. And, and if that's a single family, that's 400 for one house. That's not bad in my area. Single families would lose money. But if I buy a duplex and each side's cash flowing 900 bucks, that's $1,800 in profit coming in from that duplex from one property. Um, and the one, the fourplex I'm in is profiting $2,500 a month with me still living here. It's, it's time. Time in the market beats timing the market. When you buy and you're getting that five to 10% return, whatever's good or great in your area, two or three years later, rents go up. And historically, they have not gone down since 1914. When we started tracking the data, rents have only gone up. There are some periods of time where rents will plateau and be flat and not go up for a year or two, but they over every five year period, they've only gone up. So I don't think you're missing anything, but time and keep investing, keep at it. Jason, howdy, have you ever done any spear fishing? I have not, but my brother does a bunch of that. Um, not my thing. For a long time, fishing wasn't my thing because I didn't like the taste of fish. But I grew up in California where really all you have is trout, maybe bass or some body feeding something. But here in Washington, there's more halibut and salmon. And so now I eat fish, but still not a fisher person. They sell that stuff in stores. It's a lot less effort. Brad, howdy. Thank you. And congrats. Thank you. Rob, I recommend Buzios Brazil. Nice. I think you mentioned one time some other things in Brazil I want to try out too. Michael Smith, question. Have you thought of Malaysia or Montenegro? Both have coastlines. Eastern Europe was a super cheap place with a European feel. I'd have to check it out. I think the last time I thought of anything in Europe, it was going to be islands off of Greece, um, but still not sure. So I haven't thought of those yet. Stephen, howdy. What do you think of someone like you investing in rentals after having already retired from a nine to five at the age of 65? sitting on cash, son has similar investment desires. Maybe partner with your son. Um, I, I think if you have money, there's no reason to not put it to work. I would find something like my system that's very passive. Get to know a couple handymen that you find at a local REI meetup so you're not the one going out there to replace a faucet or to figure out what the problem is or replace blinds when you need to. So have those handymen ready. Learn how to use the Thumbtack app. Um, maybe use a property manager so it's even less hands-on because a lot of times people invest when they're 30 and they property manage until they're 60 and then they sell because they don't want to deal with it anymore instead of at some point transitioning to property management. Um, I don't think there's an age to, to not. I, I will probably still be at some point buying another rental when I'm 60 or 70 or 80 um, because it resets the depreciation cycle, lets you write off your, your, your profit easier. Um, I don't have this desire to have 30 or 40 or 50 or 117 rental units. Um, but if it's easy to just keep adding and you have a system in place that makes it easy, I don't think your age is a detractor at all. And then my chat moved. There we go. Anthony, howdy. Does 50,000 seem a bit small for a reserve on that many properties? No. It seems a bit high. It's only seven properties and a roof. My biggest roof was 15 grand. And that was for, you know, I mean, full replacement and everything, hallway, all that. Uh, I was on a fourplex. So it's literally like four townhomes put together um, with a pitch. It was like a 13 pitch. I think it was pretty steep. Um, so no, that doesn't seem small to me at all. It seems kind of too big. Um, especially since I've never touched the money coming in from my W-2 in 12 years. It, well, no, in four years. I did in the beginning. That's really what it was for. In four years, I have not touched the reserves. The cash flow from the rentals has added to savings, taken care of repairs, maintenance, and vacancy. Never touched the reserves in four years or the W-2 income. So if for four years it's been good, I don't see why that would suddenly change. Increasing it to 50 is not because I have more units. 30,000 was high when I had 16. I'm only raising it to 50 because I don't have the safety cushion of money coming in from a W-2. I just want a little bit more money in there. So, nope, Anthony, I don't think that's high. Justin, howdy. 
Congrats. Thanks for your time, info, and motivation. We appreciate it. I appreciate you too coming. That's awesome. Tamika, I'm proud you accurately stated the acronym WIOA. I'll tell you what my day job is someday, but not today. <laughs> Are you a, not a work source counselor? I'm guessing a contractor with somebody like Career Path Services or res care or one of the state agencies that hires third party agencies to work for workforce to distribute the funds nice isa okay was your first duty station camp courtney i was way up at camp schwab did just training up there uh got arrested at camp hansen i can honestly say i've never been arrested inside the united states um i was arrested at camp hansen because of a rumor <laughs> it was too much of an overshare um, but yeah, no, Okinawa is beautiful. Uh, I got an honorable discharge when I got out after six years, way after leaving Okinawa. Uh, NJP, though. Uh, lumberjack landlord, not sleeping, still awake. Okay, not retired. Yes, you get a certain point where cash flow is so great, you literally can fix basically anything out of cash flow. Still have 50,000 sitting, but don't use it every that's That's what my experience has been like. Yep. Michael Smith. Thank you, Matt, for saying that. Michael Smith. Dion, I signed up for one rental course because of your endorsement. Thank you. Make sure he buys you some more water. <laughs> Love the content. Please keep posting. No, that's awesome. Um, let me know what you think of his course. That would be great. I, I took it and then I added content to it. I liked it. I like that it's, you don't have to watch 7,000 videos to get all of the content that's there. It's there. It's refined into that. It's an affordable price. Um, I actually took it so I could do a review video on it. Um, and then he was like, hey, why don't you put your binder strategy in some, you know, um, I think he had me do self-management and then Matt did self-management too. Yeah. Cool. Keith. The FDIC adds together all single accounts owned by the same person at the same bank and then ensures the total up to 250 March 8th, 2022. That is right. So if Bank of America goes out right now, I could lose some money. I have always thought I would have, if I had that much money, I would take, you know, 250 in one bank and then I would put the other in like Chase or Wells Fargo or something. Have I explained to you that I'm lazy? <laughs> Too lazy to protect hundred and fifty thousand dollars hundred forty five thousand dollars by making another account yeah i need therapy rob thanks ciao have a good night cool we're gonna wrap it up there unless any other questions pop up while i'm saying the chows to everybody dj howdy ciao jay thank you seriously congrats have a great night thank you too mark ham i just realized what is going on congratulations <laughs> thank you nice um, Tom, just dropped and hooked and ready to participate. Awesome. Larry, last question before we wrap this up. Isn't risk of paying off mortgages is you eliminate the bank, a non-equity partner from insurance protection? Any big claims made with 100% equity may harm portfolio, especially if big happens two times or more. Or more. That's actually a thought I almost said earlier when I was thinking of, oh, I could sell a house, pay off two mortgages, then I'd have two more paid off. There's three forms of asset protection that I use. It's not an LLC because there's no asset protection there. The first is insurance. So homeowner's insurance on the properties with 300,000 slip fall or injury coverage and then full replacement value on the property. So insurance is the first one. Second is leverage. You're right, Larry. I absolutely like having mortgages because banks are in first position. If I'm ever sued, they don't get the asset. Um, courts are usually not creative enough to make you tap equity to take care of that. Uh, so your form of asset protection is that. And then the third one, if you want, you have to come back next week and ask me what the third form of asset protection is. Thanks, North Colorado Don and Jose. Oh, howdy. And thank you, Lumberjack. Larry, exactly. I have an amazing attorney, not as good as the bank's team of them. Exactly. Michael Smith. Yeah, great. Even the amount of conflicts the U.S. gets involved in. If you still recommend joining, what would be safer jobs? Infantry. Backbone of the military. You join the army, you're an 11 Bravo, you join the Marines, you're an 0311. I don't know if the Navy or the Chair Force has an infantry division, um, as we call it, the Navy Uber and the Marines. Um, 
I don't, I don't know what jobs are safe. I think drone pilots probably safe. Um, there's admin jobs that are generally safe. I think joining the military as, as if you join the Marines, everybody is a, is an infantryman and then you get your MLS training after that. Um, I don't know. I've never thought of it that way. I literally went into the Marine Corps recruiter and said, he loved this. I want to blow stuff up. Will you take me? That was all it took to get in the Marines. Um, and then it took a long time to realize that the blue crayons taste better. Uh, Matthew, you keep 20,000 in the bank for five properties, still have yet to touch it because usually cash flow covers whatever pops up and just drop 4,000 in miscellaneous emergencies this month. Still haven't touched the 20,000. That's what my experience has been too. It doesn't feel like it in the first few years when you're building the reserves. It feels like every expense comes out of that because you don't have the reserves built up yet and then you don't have the cash flow from several assets. But once you have a few, the cash flow generally takes care of it. Clinton, don't forget to research recasting. Thank you. Great video. Recasting with more information. Gee, there's 38 chats on my phone. That's uh, that's going to be fun to figure out what that is. Recasting. And I don't want to look at the chats now because I'll get distracted. Um, um, Eric, howdy. Congratulations. I'm 40 and have 150 units. Nice. I'm Central Kentucky. I'm in full empire building mode. Were you like this at 40? I'm at 30K cash flow, but can grow it like crazy. That was no at 40. I didn't even have a thousand dollars in the bank. I didn't start investing or saving for the first investment until after 40. So I was definitely not like that at 40. And I'm not like that now. I have 16 units and I make the joke every now and then that I'm not even sure I want that many. I have talked about it a little bit tonight. I might sell a house and pay off two mortgages, which doesn't make sense for asset protection, but it would increase cash flow and reduce the number of units I have to take care of. I am not in empire building mode. I never was. I was in freedom mode. If I never get out of bed again, if I never, I never have to go to work. I did the math on the whiteboard the other day. I get paid $19 an hour, 24 hours a day, every day of the week on holidays. doesn't matter whether, whether I'm watching TV or doing anything, that's what I'm making with 16 units that takes a total of two hours a month to manage. Uh, like total respect for you, Eric. Sounds like you're killing it. Matt the Lumberjack Landlord's killing it. Michael Zuber's killing it. Not my goals. My goal was make work optional and that didn't take a lot of units. Uh, I'm not a motivated hard charger. Like in the military, that was the thing, right? Um, be the tip of the spear. But as investing, it, it, it works for me because it's easy. And, and simple. Save a down payment, buy a property, take care of the property, use the binder strategy to get the rents where I want it. That's it. Like, I'm not trying to, no HELOCs, no revis, no sale, no 1031, no creative financing, no creative strategies, just absolutely straight out of the book, one rental at a time. From the MLS, traditional lending, one rental at a time. Within 10 years or less, Pretty much anybody can be in the position I'm in right now where you can literally walk into a job like I did this morning and say, these aren't the words, but I have golden handcuffs worth over $2 million, about $2 million, and I'm walking away from it. So, yeah. I am retiring at 52 on 14,000 cash flow. So... Eric, your question is, I mean, ambitious. Would you have retired at 40 on 30,000? Um, do you have kids? Is college and expenses in front of them or behind them? What are your goals? Matt, the lumberjack landlord, wouldn't retire with 30,000 in cash flow. I know he wants multiples of that because he has not only his lifestyle he wants to support, but he wants to contribute um, to society. And um, I've met too much of society, so that's not my interest. Um, so a lot of that depends on what your goals are and uh, what your lifestyle is. And me, yeah, I probably would have. Um, Cause I'm retiring at 52 with 14,000. Catherine, howdy. Do you own all of your properties under your name or how are they structured? There is a long list of reasons why none of my properties are in an LLC. 
I will be putting my properties in a trust, but that's for inheritance purposes, more so than asset protection. Um, they're all in my name. There's three forms of asset protection and an LLC is not one of them. There is absolutely no asset protection with an LLC unless you have partners. Um, I actually have a video on my channel called LLC Rant, why you don't need an LLC. Uh, if you want to know how I've done it. Um, there are times it makes sense to have an LLC. Do you have partners? Do you want to use hard money? Like things where lenders might require it. Yes, it makes total sense to do that. But there's no asset protection in it. That, that, that there is no tax benefits in an LLC at all. The IRS actually calls them a disregarded entity. So they're, they're, they have no impact on your taxes. Um, but thank you for that. I'm going to look at this. Eli, have a good night. Matthew, have a good night. Thank you. There was some rough and tumble rugged guy here last week. He did a great job. I appreciate it. Cool. I want to thank everybody for hanging out tonight. I appreciate it. Um, don't forget that every time you hit the like button, an angel gets its wings. I mean, sometimes it's Lucifer, but he's an angel. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk.